Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the, for, for those of you who I don't know, I'm the director of the Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. And on behalf of the Duke Margolis Center and the McKenzie Center for Health System Reform, I'd like to welcome you to our event today on state and private sector innovation and the future of U.S. healthcare. Uh, this is obviously a timely topic uh, given the um, challenges that uh, you all have heard about related to health care reform. Uh, but we're going to try and take a, a little bit of a different tack here. And I'll explain that in my, in my opening comments. And you'll, you'll hear from my uh, counterpart, uh, Shabam, at, uh, uh, at McKinsey about that as well. Uh, before I get started, uh, just a, a couple of things. Uh, disclaimers, uh, we are not taking partisan positions on these issues. Uh, we are uh, approaching the challenges of, of improving access to coverage and improving uh, state programs like Medicaid uh, from an evidence-based standpoint. So we want to support a frank uh, exchange of ideas here. Um, would also uh, encourage you all to uh, uh, join us uh, uh, in uh, tweeting online, uh, which is uh, uh, hash time, uh, hashtag, uh, let me make sure I get this right, uh, Ellen, state of uh, health reform. Uh, you'll, see the, you'll see the tweets going out from, uh, from Duke Margolis uh, 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 very shortly on all this, too. So please join the conversation online. I also want to thank those of you who are with us uh, on the web uh, today. I have uh, a lot of participants there, too. And for those of you who are in the room, uh, you know that uh, this is a, a newly opened uh, building uh, housing our new center, uh, like uh, health reform itself, kind of a work in progress. So uh, first event here today. Thank you all for making it downstairs, but we hope to see a lot more of you at future events uh, as well. Uh, so uh, it is not news uh, that uh, there are uh, concerns, political debates, uh, and uncertainty uh, about the future of many aspects of uh, health care in this country. And that particularly relates to health care coverage uh, in the individual insurance market uh, and affecting uh, Medicaid populations, especially uh, the uh, Medicaid expansion populations under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, while the Affordable Care Act has led to significant reductions in the uninsured rate, it's an important impact on access to care for many Americans who are having trouble getting it before. Uh, there are concerns about the, the law, and I don't want to go through these in detail. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, uh, concerns about rising premiums, rising uh, uh, cost sharing and deductibles for individuals who do not get extra uh, subsidies uh, because of their uh, higher income, uh, concerns about the fragility of insurance risk pools, individual insurance risk pools uh, in many states, uh, and also uh, in light of all this, concerns about other steps that would focus on what we think of as, as a real health care reform, that is changing the way uh, the health care works to make it more efficient, to get better outcomes for populations, and more value for the dollars that we spend. Many people view this time as a challenging one for working on those issues together. One of the main themes of today uh, is that it, we think it is possible uh, to do both at the same time, to, to both work through uh, some very challenging debates about how health insurance coverage should work, but also to take steps in the process, often steps that have a lot of bipartisan support, uh, to reform the way that health care itself works. So uh, we'll be returning to those themes today. It's a little bit more uh, context setting. Uh, as, uh, as you all know, uh, the individual exchanges uh, uh, ensure a, a significant number of Americans today, leveling off at around uh, 12 million or so individuals. Uh, as you hear and as you saw in some of the recent McKinsey reports that we're uh, highlighting along with this conference, uh, many of those markets have a limited number of carriers uh, with concerns about what will happen to participation uh, in the coming months, uh, especially with uh, uncertainty about some of the health care policies affecting the exchanges. Uh, expansion of Medicaid has led to a significantly larger increase in coverage. Uh, this map shows uh, from Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, the states that have expanded coverage and the approximation of the number of people who have uh, 
receive coverage. And so you can see uh, there's a red and blue states here with different shading. Uh, that's to convey that a lot of the expansion states are Republican states, uh, a lot of the red on the map, uh, and a lot of coverage uh, uh, impacts as a result. Uh, at the same time, though, there are concerns about the, the costs of the Medicaid expansion, uh, with the, the cost this year uh, approaching uh, uh, $70 billion or more. The 10-year cost of the Medicaid expansion is projected to be uh, on the order of $1 trillion, uh, so uh, uh, significant costs associated with the coverage expansions. And that really leads me into uh, what, what we view as kind of a foundation for why uh, these reform issues have been uh, so politically controversial and re really are the, the front end of the spear uh, for the philosophical debates about the role of government, and particularly the federal government, uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, health care markets and in, uh, in Americans' lives more generally. Uh, this chart highlights how important health care spending is, including spending for the insurance coverage expansions uh, through the individual market subsidies and through the Medicaid expansions, uh, with health care programs uh, now projected to be about 8% uh, or more of GDP over the next 10 years, 5% of GDP now. Uh, just to put things in perspective, I, I mentioned a trillion dollars going into expected costs of the Medicaid expansions over the coming decades. Uh, the cost this year, the Medicaid program alone, uh, is about $600 billion uh, uh, with significant growth expected uh, in this program in, in the years ahead. Uh, and to put, uh, put that in perspective as well, uh, my former agency, CMS, is projected to spend about a trillion dollars this year, including spending on the ACA subsidies on Medicare, on the federal part of the Medicaid programs. Uh, for all the controversy that we've seen in other areas of, uh, uh, of federal policy, for example, the, the, the federal budget proposal from President Trump, uh, this, these are much, much bigger numbers. Uh, all of President Trump's proposals in, in the area of HHS combined, so reductions in NIH spending, reductions in social service spending, amounted to a total of $15 billion. So small, uh, small numbers compared to the, the costs associated with the coverage expansions. And so no surprise uh, that this is where so much of the political debate uh, has been focused uh, in terms of um, uh, health care coverage uh, reform. It has such a big impact on the overall federal budget, uh, on further uh, legislative agenda items for both parties. Uh, this is not a partisan issue. Uh, the, the current uh, uh, budget reconciliation uh, legislation that is in, uh, the, the budget sequestration, I'm sorry, legislation that is in place uh, has, uh, that President Obama signed, uh, similarly put a priority on expanding the health care uh, costs, expanding coverage and expanding payments for health care services um, at the expense of programs like uh, social services, early childhood education, uh, other uh, infrastructure spending, uh, other non-defense uh, discretionary programs, uh, with the result that uh, we are seeing some macro trends in health outcomes in the United States that really do distinguish us from other countries. So despite the additional health care spending, despite the expansions in coverage, uh, we're seeing a leveling off overall of uh, American mortality rates. A lot of that is driven by increases, increases in mortality rates for some populations, including uh, low to moderate income uh, white Americans, a very important group in the election uh, that, uh, that, that happened last fall, a group that was intended, low to moderate income individuals intended to be helped uh, by the coverage expansions, uh, but yet are still showing increases in mortality primarily from cardiovascular disease, uh, lung diseases, other chronic illnesses uh, that uh, and relate to things like behavioral issues and, and other social factors, community factors, uh, that we are not really addressing, uh, at least so far, with the way that we're reforming health care. Uh, so uh, th that's uh, been reflected in, in work recently that we've been involved with, with the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, they recently issued a report on vital directions for health and health care reform with a whole set of reform recommendations driven and supported by evidence and uh, a broad base of, uh, of uh, political and academic and, uh, and clinical and other experts behind it, uh, which uh, highlighted the, the continuing uh, inefficiencies in our healthcare system. 
uh, by some estimates, uh, 30% or more than $750 billion uh, now, uh, and uh, highlighted some proposals to address this that have considerable bipartisan support, uh, some of which I'll talk about in, in just a moment. Uh, so uh, lots of opportunities to do better and really an, an increasing urgency to do this with the rising costs of care, uh, it gets harder and harder to resolve the political debates around how we can cover and provide access to Americans as well as the more uh, fundamental issues of how do we actually support improvements in population health uh, with these rising costs. Uh, we're going to have to do things differently and that leads to some of the urgency uh, around addressing both uh, the future of health care coverage reform and steps to try to promote uh, more efficiency and more value in health care. So a few, uh, a few thoughts about uh, how, to, how to do this. Uh, uh, obviously, a uh, lot of discussion right now about how to stabilize insurance markets in states uh, that are fragile and that uh, have limited participation. CMS recently issued a regulation that uh, was intended to provide more predictability and more stable enrollment uh, in the insurance markets through steps like shorter open enrollment periods, more flexibility for insurers on meeting uh, actuary, actuarial value requirements and tighter enforcement of special enrollment periods. Uh, there is a lot of debate and discussion right now, I'm sure we'll cover it uh, further today, around the future of federal subsidies for cost sharing reduction, the extra help that low income beneficiaries receive uh, toward their out of pocket and premium costs uh, under the ACA. If those uh, uh, subsidies go away, uh, as has been threatened, uh, that could have a significant impact on premiums and on uh, the further stability of the insurance market. Uh, but there are other ideas out there too, some of which that uh, I hope we'll have a chance to discuss, I'm sure we'll have a chance to discuss, around state actions to further stabilize markets, state actions that could be supported by uh, the federal government. So to give one example of this, it's an issue that uh, people like Peter Lee and Covered California and others in this room have been working on recently. Uh, uh, one idea is uh, reinsurance, additional payments to health plans uh, that, that attract high-risk uh, individuals. Uh, the additional payments uh, reduce uh, the losses that insurers might other face, otherwise face with these populations. Uh, and uh, uh, in the early years of the ACA, this was, uh, uh, had a significant impact on overall premiums because uh, the reduced uncertainty uh, as well as the additional payments help keep uh, the, the premium bids from the plans down. Uh, this is also uh, a key element of Medicare Part D, an insurance, an individual insurance market that is working uh, reasonably well for uh, reasonably stable for a large, uh, a very large number of Americans. Uh, but there are some challenges with reinsurance payments as well. Uh, the additional payments might reduce the incentives for, for health plans to take steps to manage complex patients more efficiently, to implement new models of care uh, where we've seen a lot of opportunities to do better. If those costs are in, in uh, large part just passed along, uh, that probably doesn't focus as much on, uh, encourages much focus on value as we would like. An alternative to this approach, again, this uh, ideas that we're working on that uh, uh, could help uh, with uh, th these kinds of uh, achieving both access to care and more affordability is uh, risk adjustment. Additional payments to plans that would go uh, in a more fixed or prospective fashion uh, to support their enrollees who have high expected costs. Uh, the fact that this is, these are, would not be open-ended payments, at least not fully open-ended, would provide stronger incentives for the plans to work with health care providers to develop systems uh, that can deliver care more efficiently for high-risk, complex patients. Uh, so that's one example. Uh, another example where uh, there is discussion around whether coverage can be improved at the same time as care uh, can be reformed. Uh, is a, another feature of the Affordable Care Act, uh, Section 1332, which potentially gives states uh, considerable flexibility to restructure uh, the way that they provide coverage, the way that they work with insurers and, uh, and private payers uh, in their states, uh, as long as they achieve similar coverage, access, and cost results. Uh, this is uh, the statutory requirement, uh, as, as the slide shows, uh, uh, requires that the 1332 waivers would have to provide coverage that's at least as comprehensive and affordable. I'm sure there will be some debate about in interpreting uh, uh, whether those conditions are met. 
Uh, but so far, uh, there has not been a lot of specific guidance from HHS or CMS about how uh, states could undertake uh, more substantial reforms uh, in their insurance systems and in their care delivery systems uh, using this kind of authority. Uh, there have been a few waivers submitted so far, uh, a reinsurance program in Alaska that's uh, uh, taken important steps to stabilize the insurance market there, uh, an alternative for small business coverage in Hawaii that had a pre-existing uh, kind of coverage uh, requirement, but so far pretty limited uh, proposals, uh, even though uh, there's a lot of speculation and some states uh, actually uh, exploring whether they could do much more through this approach. Many of these reform approaches uh, involve changing the way that we pay for health care. Uh, partly this is about creating more incentive, uh, incentivizing uh, providers. But I think the more important and more successful programs here uh, are ones that the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network has categorized as Category 3 and Category 4, which really are about shifting the way that we pay away from a focus on individual services and individual health care providers to a focus on patients or episodes of care, kind of more inclusive ways of, uh, of reflecting the needs of patients. Uh, these kinds of payment reforms have been used to support better care coordination, uh, to support uh, more efficient ways of delivering care, such as changing sites of service or relying on wireless uh, or internet-based technologies rather than patients having uh, uh, to come in to receive care, team-based approaches to care and the like. And they're being implemented by a wide range of states, including some of those red and blue states uh, that I showed you before. Uh, this is also an area where the new administration is likely to take things in, in new directions. Uh, Dr. Price, Secretary of HHS, was a supporter of the MACRA law that reformed Medicare's physician payments, but he has particularly emphasized finding ways to make that law work for smaller physician practices, not just large uh, integrated organizations or large consolidated organizations. I'd also expect to see in the coming months more of an emphasis on payment reform occurring through private insurance plans rather than just uh, uh, the traditional Medicare program leading, uh, important as Medicare is uh, in supporting new kinds of payment models. Uh, approaches through regional or state-based multi-payer collaboratives. There are a number of states that are exploring these models and implementing them right now. Uh, and also, uh, an emphasis on something that's been missing or only present in a limited way in many of the payment reforms implemented so far, which has been consumer involvement. Uh, if you think about it, a lot of these payment reforms uh, give health care providers more flexibility in how they deliver care, uh, more ability to, to use uh, services that otherwise would not have been reimbursed under a traditional fee-for-service system uh, in return for more accountability for results, uh, getting overall costs down or improving measures of quality. Uh, and if they do that, they get to share in the savings. But most of those efforts have so far been focused on the health care providers, not the consumers. Uh, there are a lot of examples in the private sector and in the implementation of Medicare Part D, for example, where sharing savings with consumers when they made choices uh, to get the care that they needed at a lower cost uh, could lead to better outcomes and more rapid reforms in the way that care is delivered. And in fact, one way of looking at this shift towards an emphasis on uh, episode of care payment models or uh, all-inclusive primary care payment models that help people uh, uh, coordinate their care more effectively or even accountable care organizations, uh, ACOs, is that it could be a basis for transparency around some results that really matter uh, for patients, not, not the prices of individual services, but kind of the rolled up cost uh, of a whole episode of care or their whole experience of care if they choose to coordinate their services through a particular provider. So I expect to see more uh, uh, of those kinds of reforms coming too, and especially more work through states uh, on implementing these reforms. Uh, there are a lot of state experts in the room today who have been tracking uh, these kinds of reforms, uh, uh, the NGA, the National uh, uh, Association of Medicaid Directors, and, and others, uh, states implementing uh, accountable care organizations, uh, in many cases uh, in Medicaid programs. ACOs and these new payment models are not just about uh, coordinating medical services more efficiently, but integrating um, uh, behavioral health services, social services, housing, housing assistance, 
uh, services that, if targeted to the right patients, can have a big impact on medical, out on medical costs and health outcomes. Uh, we'll hear more about that uh, in our upcoming session with the, uh, from a state that's actually doing uh, a lot of this ACO work. Uh, bundled payments for primary care services and episode of care services, again, moving away from fee-for-service happening in states like uh, Arkansas and Tennessee, which have had early savings and some promising results in terms of improving uh, quality. And many of these initiatives at the state level uh, can bring together multiple payers. So we'll hear more about those as well. Uh, one gap right now is that many of these programs uh, have not yet been fully evaluated or publicly reported, and it is challenging to reform care. While some health care providers have thrived under these new models, many are struggling, uh, and the results of many of the payment reforms, uh, while showing improvements in quality, have not had uh, substantial, rapid uh, impacts on health care costs. So we need to learn more uh, to give people more confidence and give uh, policymakers more confidence about implementing these reforms. Just today, uh, Duke Margolis released a survey of all of the evidence out there, all the published studies uh, of payment reform models, finding some big gaps, particularly around uh, state-based reforms and reforms being implemented in commercial programs. We included in that report some recommendations on how uh, to reduce the cost for states uh, and commercial plans in participating in generating more evidence that could guide further policy reforms uh, and uh, so they could benefit more from it. So uh, some important challenges ahead, but also opportunities. Uh, we think that states are going to be playing a much larger role in driving reforms in health care, uh, and uh, not just in coverage, uh, but in reforms that can influence the cost and availability uh, of uh, health insurance, uh, of not just health insurance, but also care as well. The debates about reforming insurance coverage seem very likely to continue for some time, uh, reflecting these deep philosophical differences about the role of government with health care costs so high. Uh, but if we can take steps at the same time as we're continuing those debates to continue to improve care, uh, reduce health care costs by supporting state efforts like the promising ones that I've mentioned briefly, uh, we think we can make more progress. So uh, with that, I want to turn this over to uh, Shubham Singhal, who has uh, led a recent report from McKinsey on the imperatives for the U.S. healthcare system that I think will complement uh, some of the framing remarks that I've just made. And again, thank you all for joining us today. Shubham. Thank you. Thanks, Mark, for setting that up. Um, what I'll do in the next 20 minutes is share uh, a little bit of um, uh, the high-level perspectives from research that we have done on the next imperatives uh, for U.S. healthcare. It, it's important to have this conversation. Uh, we can get stuck in moving coverage uh, and um, you know how, who covers what and what's subsidized. But ultimately, if you step back, just looking at healthcare overall and is the cost and quality where we need to be, as Mark said. Um, so just before we um, start, um, uh, th those of you that know us and those that don't, McKinsey is not a uh, policy shop. That's not what we do. We do not advocate for any policy, um, nor provide uh, any, any specific uh, uh, lobbying or anything of the sort. So uh, the research that we do is to inform uh, factually what uh, we see happening, where opportunities lie, and for private and public sector institutions to be able to improve uh, their overall performance. Um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Mark uh, talked about it. Seven years into the ACA, um, Reform 1.0, if you will, um, we've had successes. Um, we've covered more people. Uh, we've put in place different kinds of payment models that Mark talked about. Um, we've been able to, in some cases, see healthcare utilization uh, be tamed, particularly around inpatient. Um, at the same time, uh, while we have expanded coverage, we have a fair number of people that are uncovered, fair number of them that decide to go voluntarily uncovered. Um, clearly, the value proposition of what's being sold to them, subsidy and all, is not uh, resonating. Um, uh, the evidence is early or uh, in some cases mixed in terms of its sustainability on some of the payment models, so more to be done there. And consumer healthcare costs continue to rise um, within that. Um, our healthcare system still has longstanding problems that we've had. Um, we, we see year-on-year -year price increases. 
It's only one direction. All we talk about when we talk about reducing healthcare costs is simply how much is it going to go up. We never actually talk about reducing anything. Um, price variation and transparency. We still have a lot of price variation with limited transparency, and a lot of that variation has little to do with in a correlation between cost and quality. Um, you know, there's a lot of evidence in that, and that still continues to be the place uh, today, the case today. Um, uh, and uh, uh, households still face financial distress due to medical expenditures. Um, so we haven't, while we have put money into the system, while we have uh, provided subsidies, that, that hasn't taken away uh, the financial distress that uh, can be caused. Um, uh, and, and then you have a regulatory framework, uh, which is well-intentioned uh, over time, but as it is kind of built up, uh, largely hinders innovation. And most things in healthcare move uh, at a pace that is quite a bit slower than any other sector of the economy. Uh, we can always say it's for good reason. We probably don't want to move things too fast, but um, the question is, uh, you know, are we, are we really kind of uh, enabling innovation to happen? And then the final thing is, uh, I won't go through all of these, but uh, just in the, from 2010 to 2015, we talk a lot about in the individual market exchanges, but even in the employer world, the insurance contributions that employees are making have galloped along at a very high rate. Uh, so the affordability issue uh, is not going to be the only for those that are insur buying insurance for themselves on the uh, exchange market, uh, but, but um, uh, those that are actually insured through uh, employers. So um, in the research that we did, uh, we looked at a lot of um, external research. We looked at a lot of the, um, our own kind of delving into the economics. Uh, and there are three things that emerge. Um, one is uh, achieving uh, productivity gains, um, which uh, is the lifeblood of any economy in being able to deliver sustainably uh, a more over time uh, in a way that is affordable. Um, so that's one. Uh, two is the improving of uh, the functioning of healthcare markets. Uh, we do have a private system where private providers, private insurers, and others are involved. Uh, and uh, is, the, is the market therefore functioning in the right way? And how do we improve that? And the third is improving the health status of the population. Um, uh, you all don't need me to tell you uh, the comparisons that exist on the health status of the population in the United States, which compared to most developed countries uh, is quite a bit worse. And, and ultimately in healthcare, what we do uh, is fueled by the demand that gets created through uh, that health status. So if we take productivity, um, you know, and this is not particularly scientific, but we take on any number of things that we consume in our, uh, in our, in our daily life. And what you will find has, happens over time is that you get a lot more. So take cell phones. Um, back in 88, I don't know what that was. It was a giant brick a suitcase that you had to carry around. Um, it barely did anything, and now you have uh, the power in any of these smartphones of greater than what a supercomputer would have been back, back at that point in time. Uh, and the price, you know, that uh, affordability is better today. You can see that for computers. Um, uh, same thing in airlines, same thing in a service industry like even wealth management. And if we compare that with in uh, healthcare, whether it's in insurance, whether it's uh, just the cost of an inpatient admission, uh, or, or pharmacy, and by the way, these are much shorter periods of time over which this has gone up. It just goes up in one direction. I mean, this, any period of time that you look at, uh, that's kind of what, uh, what, what is going on. And a big part of that has to do with the fact that um, healthcare really doesn't deliver much productivity gain at all. Now, you might say, well, 0.4% is actually terrific. It's kind of positive, at least at a minimum. If you erase the effects of the Great Recession, it is actually negative, it's deeply negative. The one year of the Great Recession, we grew productivity in our sector by 2.8%. Uh, now, the one side of it also says if the stimulus is quite right, it is possible to do because we went back and looked at all the research. We didn't find anyone who was denied care. We did not find any quality of care that was particularly worse in 2008 than the years preceding or years since, uh, none of that. So how did we figure out how to do this uh, in a more productive way? It's a, it's a question uh, that needs to be answered. And, and, and a lot of it um, uh, requires in healthcare to drive um, productivity. 
is really a combination. There's a private part of this, which is around um, business model change. Are we innovating? Um, we designed this system probably 40 years ago or so. Uh, largely after World War II, maybe we tweaked it with HMOs, et cetera. And so since the 80s, not too much, right? We've got a hospital-based big factory system. We've moved a bit out to outpatient, et cetera. But that's kind of the system that we designed for ourselves. We've got big data. We've got all kinds of computing power and analytics today. We've got remote means of digital that are enabling various means of interaction. But the business models we use in healthcare are largely the same that we would have used in the 80s and 90s. So that's a question um, as to why aren't we innovating the business models to kind of drive that forward. And the second part of it is that goes hand in hand with it is, do we have smarter regulations in place that actually enable that uh, to happen? You know, for example, um, if you look at the underlying uh, uh, view that we have, which are very well-intentioned regulations around patient safety, uh, you know, quality access and the like, uh, we're still designed them in an era where we control input. What is the nurse staffing ratios we should have kinds of things. Uh, today, we can measure everything, right? We have data available, more data than we know what to do with. We can analyze it. Uh, payment models that we're putting in place are based on outcomes, so we can look at what the outcomes are, but our model hasn't transformed to be one based on looking at outcomes, it is still based on input uh, when, we, when we think about uh, the, the regulatory landscape. And so that's, um, uh, you know, the question we've got to ask. Now, have we seen evidence that this happens? Absolutely. If you look at ambulatory surgery centers, um, it's not a new story. But if you look at it, they are actually very focused on particular procedures. They do a lot of them. They do them well. And uh, they are actually more productive. By the way, the margins are higher for the provider, but at the same time, the costs are lower. Right? But both of those aspects work, which is a good sign when you can get um, that sort of business model innovation and, and change to work. Um, Diagnostic labs are doing similar things with being able to pool demand at the front end with the customer collection centers, being able to take them into bigger uh, uh, centers where they actually do the diagnostic, kind of bring it back, right? It's a different business model than having underutilized labs in a range of facilities all over the place. Um, smart regulations are two kinds of things here. One, if we were to look at what kinds of um, regulations actually hinder um, uh, progress, there's a lot of outdated or inconsistent regulations that get in the way um, between state, federal, various federal parts. Uh, you know, there's a lot of inconsistency that happens. And then the second part of it is, you know, have we made smart regulations where it makes innovation easier? I mean, those are kind of the two sides of the coin. What are those, some of those things could be? I'll just use an example of uh, inconsistencies that exist, and you can find many of these this is one on telemedicine. If we were to look across the different states and what, the Medi what Medicaid rules are, if we were to look at uh, Medicare uh, and what it says in terms of what the originating site can be, what the provider type can be, you know, what the licensing for all of this is, it, it's, it's completely different when you go state by state and different classes of coverage that we have. Now, in the world of digital, as all of you know, if you're going to use that, it scales very rapidly and nationally. You, if you box it up, again, you're not going to get the benefit that you can, you can unleash with that kind of a change that you're going to put in place. I don't use this as an example that telemedicine by itself will solve the world, but I do use it as if a change, if you get something that is going to be a different model, for it to be adopted, it cannot run into that many barriers uh, and it needs to have a much clearer uh, uh, way of working. Smart regulations, again, we're, we're not policy people on, 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 on regula regulations, but um, what are some of the things that you can do? I mean, we've done some, right? I mean, if you have standard uh, for processing claims, which we've done, that, you know, that's great. That allows you to be able to use the data. Everyone understands it. Uh, if you have standards for making sure that electronic health records don't become silos in which the patient's medical data is stuck, um, how do we do that? How do we make it liquid and available around a patient? Um, and then building enablers, uh, whether it's transparency, where it's data that can be made broadly available for all to be able to analyze and look at performance, all of those kinds of things can generally lead to a 
much better enablement uh, of uh, driving innovation and that can drive uh, productivity. So that's kind of the first one on productivity. Second, on the improving the functioning of healthcare markets. Um, two sides to this coin, right? I mean, oftentimes people kind of get stuck on, let's take one side of it, but there are two sides of the coin. Um, one is the demand side, which is the consumer and the patient, and what incentives do they have to engage in their own health, to engage in making the right kind of choices. And the other side is the supply side, which is we have a high, um, uh, 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 a high level of technical proficiency uh, professionals, um, you know, across on the clinical side, and what are their incentives uh, ultimately to be able to uh, provide the right kinds of uh, right kinds of care in the most efficient way? Um, now, some examples on this, uh, if we look at it, and, and Mark talked a bit about the uh, the supply side. And I'll get to it, but, but um, you know, let me take some of the demand side levers. We have seen at this point uh, that um, if you do put skin in the game, so actuarial value as it, as it goes down, uh, the utilization pattern is different. We've done this on a risk and benefit adju you know, risk um, adjusted basis in the same kind of population, age, gender, et cetera. And when you look at it, th that, that happens. And we've seen in many of these, you can design uh, different kinds of plans where you're making sure that the right kind of utilization is still protected when you do this. The other thing that interestingly happens, and you've probably seen this as well, is interestingly, even in, if you define healthcare broadly, um, parts that are not covered by our system actually show the dynamics that I showed you earlier with airlines or cell phones or laptops and the like. You do see an actual uh, change in a price of these services to make it affordable and available to more people, which if we compare it to just the physician price index, we don't see uh, in what is covered. So what's going on? I mean, how different are these things really that we should have that kind of a spread uh, that emerges just over a, you know, eight year period? And again, you can look at it um, at any point in time. And what's going on is on the other ones, the consumer both pays for it and shops for it and makes a decision and directs volume. Even when we have consumer-driven health plans, the, the table is set between an insurer and a provider. Really, the consumer at that point has limited ability to actually affect price and volume shifts in a meaningful way. And so there is a real question on can we unleash this uh, a bit more. Now, it is quite important to think about this because you can't just simply apply it uh, all, over the, uh, all over the map. And, one of the things we believe uh, in looking at whether it's the demand or the supply side is quite important is to understand in this three trillion dollars of spend we have what kind of medical risk are we talking about and what incentives are we creating uh, and what is important within that is severity frequency the discretion that a consumer has and how dependent over time you know certain choices you make today are to the cost as they accrue over time so let me make it simple Insurance is typically designed for things that are random, infrequent, catastrophic, and that if you have them once, doesn't suggest you're gonna have that same thing again, right? I mean, you, whether it's contagious disease or it's an accident, et cetera, those sorts of things, and you can very easily put them into insurance, and you don't have to necessarily affect a whole lot of uh, consumer behavior, because let's say you got, you know, uh, had an accident, uh, a severe accident, um, you know, the ambulance will take you where they will take you and the, uh, the folks in the ER will do what they will do and if uh, any surgery is required, they will do what they will do. All of that has very little consumer discretion when that kind of a model exists and it's more on the delivery side. On the other hand, if during your own behaviors and lifestyle with a chronic condition, if you're managing your weight, if you're exercising, if you are um, you, you know, kind of going to the doctor on time if you're adhering with your drugs. All of those are really something that is in the control uh, of a consumer. And so it becomes important, and so I won't go into details here, uh, but, you know, you, we break down the total spend into three, into eight different uh, medical spend categories, and what you see is depending on each one of these and the consumer's discretion, the consumer's ability to absorb the risk or the expense, 
you can, you, 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 what is optimal in terms of the financing mechanism and the reimbursement approach can be quite different, can be quite different in terms of what uh, you look at at that point in time. So I'll take chronic and the catastrophic that's related to chronic. You need insurance, it's big enough expenses. You can't just say, hey, go uncovered for these. You need the right incentives within that, right? I mean, you design the insurance and how it pays within that. And then you need something that really incentivizes the management of a population. Because if we don't integrate the care and manage a population's health, we're not gonna get to the right outcomes. And this is where a lot of the population health management with some of the episodes of care for some of the catastrophic within it kind of comes together and becomes quite important to manage. And so again, we often debate in general terms whether such a model is good or such a model is bad, but really it depends on what populations, what expenses, what risks are we talking about, uh, and being a lot sharper and, and, and uh, uh, thoughtful about it. One of the things, and, and one example on this, Erica will talk later more about, so I won't touch upon too much, but we took in the individual market and said, if you were to take what the, what the PMPMs are, and we were to apply some of these principles on saying, hey look, you know, if there are expenses that people can cover for themselves or ought not to be covered in a way that induces utilization, and then if we applied a series of uh, uh, you know, payment model and other improvements, uh, ultimately, where could we be? And, and ultimately, I mean, we look at it, it could be anywhere, from 32 to 40%, 30 to 40% lower premiums that could exist in this kind of model, which you can plow back into, whether you provide savings and the like. The interesting thing that you see within this is there are models around the world uh, where they have done that, where they have gone to a model that is a mix of savings plus insurance and not just a you know, pure insurance-based model. So where could this, um, I'm gonna skip through this in the interest of time. I think you, you all know on the, um, on the health status of the population. Um, it is not something we solve in healthcare, uh, although we can help maintain and improve it. It kind of begins with a lot of different um, uh, parts that have to come together, whether it's with food, education, um, you know, how we design our cities, public health and the like. Um, so I'm not gonna touch too much upon that here, but it is a, uh, important piece, but then if you take all of these things together, our analysis would show that there is actually a significant improvement on an annual basis that we could actually create. And we did the analysis here simply based on what we see is evidence of things happening in the healthcare economy today, that if scaled up, whether it's business models, whether it is best practices uh, and approaches, what could you get to in terms of, an, uh, terms of an improvement? And what you get to is it could be anywhere from 284 to 532 billion per year. That's a very sizable amount if you think about within a $3 trillion uh, dollars that we spend. Um, what, it, what it would do uh, if we were to get within that range is basically put us somewhere close to GDP rate of growth for medical expenditures if we were to, if we were to achieve that by doing productivity and designing uh, the functioning of the market so both consumers and providers have the right incentives uh, ultimately to practice uh, medicine. And this is only the beginning. As I, as I began earlier, um, all of the things that we're seeing happening with technology uh, and new models of care that might emerge coming out of that, uh, that, can, that, that will have even more uh, opportunity that exists for us to be able to deliver uh, uh, better care, better quality, uh, more access to the people who don't have it, and, and be able to uh, do that over time in a way that is, uh, that is more affordable. Um, so what might folks do, particularly in the private sector? Um, uh, one is um, driving productivity improvement, and particularly from a private sector standpoint. Uh, in other industries, people who drive productivity create competitive advantage. They win in the marketplace. Um, two is disrupting the business models. Um, and uh, either as an attacker, and there are many that are trying, or, or, or as an incumbent looking to materially change. And then this kind of forum is pretty important. Um, and one of the things that is exciting for 
uh, Mark uh, and us to kind of um, to, to collaborate on this is it really requires a dialogue where you step back from the, each one of the silos and whether it's public or private and say, how do we really kind of look at the fundamentals of what we're doing and how do we kind of figure out what the right ways to solve the problem are and not in a, you know, government tries to put some regulation down and the private sector say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, that, that's not going to work or private sector suggests something and, you know, people are wary. But really, how do we actually have that uh, discussion in the right way, uh, not in a way that lobbying usually works, but in the right way to be able to um, uh, get to the right set of outcomes. So um, I'm going to pause there. Um, what we are going to go into uh, next in this afternoon is take each one of the areas and go deeper. So we'll start with Medicaid, uh, and uh, uh, Tim and others will introduce uh, who the, the speakers, uh, and we'll kind of deep dive into that. We'll do the same with the individual, the exchange marketplace, uh, and a lot um, uh, of discussion there. And then more broadly hear from some of the private sector uh, leaders, CEOs, on what is, you know, what is the innovation that they're seeing that can be driven, what, what gets in the way, what can be done more uh, to really kind of drive it. And then we'll kind of come back at the end on, um, uh, with, uh, with Senator Cassidy on uh, what are the kinds of solutions that at the state level can be achieved and can be encouraged uh, from, the, from the federal level. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, my name's Tim Ward. I'm a senior partner in McKinsey's Southern California office, and I lead our Medicaid practice nationally. And uh, before we get into the panel discussion around Medicaid and implementing change at the state level, I wanted just to frame the uh, questions and uh, talk about four things. So first of all, the historic context of uh, Medicaid spending efficiency. Uh, secondly, the uh, priorities or choices that states can make in a world of uh, increased efficiency uh, or, or flexibility. Um, thirdly, what those flexibility choices are. And then fourthly, what does all of this mean for the talent and capabilities of uh, states? Um, so first of all, a um, quick note that, uh, again, we are uh, not as a firm uh, commenting on or advocating specific government policies, and we don't provide policy advice. So I'm going to um, focus on framing some facts. So this first chart shows uh, the variation in uh, overall costs and cost growth rates uh, of Medicaid. And um, what we wanted to do was to abstract away from any of the complications in state-by-state -state comparisons that are introduced by states' differential choices around uh, the expansion. And so instead, look at a pre-expansion figure. So on the horizontal axis, uh, we have the average per member per year, PMPY, uh, cost in uh, the year 2013. And then on the vertical axis, you have the growth uh, rate of uh, PMPY costs. And, and what do you see? Well, first of all, you see a ton of variation uh, state by state. Uh, I just want to emphasize that the averages uh, here and how states are shown is based on the national mix of eligibility categories because, again, we wanted to abstract away from what a state's particular mix of uh, eligibility categories happen to look like. So we're, we're making that mix adjustment. So you see a lot of variation, but really the key point uh, to focus on here, uh, you'll see we have a vertical and a horizontal line and then a yellow dot right in the middle with the national average. And you'll see the national average in the 11-year uh, period here, 2000 to 2011 of growth rate was uh, uh, just north of 5% per year. Um, an average PMPY costs were just under uh, $7,000 in that finishing year. Uh, but of course, there's a ton of variation uh, around it. Um, and so the, really, the, where, where does this uh, get you to? Well, the, the question for us, I guess, is when you look ahead, um, there are lots of different options. There may or may not be changes to the federal financing formulae. There probably will be changes of different types from state by state as to how uh, legislatures uh, choose to continue to fund their, Medi their Medicaid programs. Um, the real question is, do we believe that uh, going forward, somewhere north of 5% per year, um, even before you get into things like the Medicaid expansion, is sustainable? 
um, as one point of comparison, medical CPI is uh, forecast uh, over the coming 10 years to uh, be around 3.7% a year. Um, one recent proposal had medical CPI plus 1%, so that's still uh, below 5% uh, a year. You can make your own judgments as to GDP growth, GDP growth per capita, and so forth. Um, either way, we see this as uh, you know, something fairly fundamental uh, in terms of a challenge for states going forward as to how they need to think about uh, uh, changing the uh, overall efficiency levels of their programs. And of course, states have a ton of options for how to do that, so what might they think about? So in a world of greater uh, flexibility, first of all, I um, just want to emphasize, of course, this is not just around increasing the efficiency of care delivery. And really, we see states uh, uh, having four major sets of options as they think about improving Medicaid sustainability and performance uh, over time with the new flexibilities that may arise. So I will come back to uh, A, so the top left, increasing the efficiency of care delivery in a second and talk about some of those uh, options. Um, but what else is there? So uh, B, improving the health of the population. Um, really here, states uh, potentially have a lot of different options going forward as to how they might think about this, especially with uh, new flexibilities that might arise. So for example, how would a state think about how to maximize return on investment for public health uh, efforts? Uh, how might a state decide to use advanced analytics to uh, really get into measuring impact and effectiveness and how to target public health uh, investments? You know, we see some states really getting quite interesting there as they think about uh, the opioid crisis, for example, and how to measure and respond to it. Um, how do you integrate investments across not just Medicaid as one example, or not just thinking about what a Department of Health might do, but how do you think about the whole in an integrated way? So that's B, improving the health of the population. C is improving the citizen experience. Um, and our survey work, by the way, shows that in general, while citizens think that healthcare is extremely important in terms of what a state uh, can be delivering, um, in many uh, many places, uh, cit citizens are not very satisfied with healthcare. Um, so what can you do about it? So states have options to think about the consumer journey from an enrollee's perspective. And are there some targeted improvements you might be able to make? Um, states might think about how do you better support the choices that individuals make at the point of care delivery? Um, what's the kind of information and how do you present it? Uh, how might you empower consumer decision making? Um, so we also finally, and this is on the right-hand side, letter D, we also see states starting more and more to think about integration, not just uh, within Medicaid, but how does that integrate with other healthcare markets in the state? So how do you think about, for example, um, uh, reducing frictional costs that uh, providers have to uh, undergo as they try to deliver care, of course, to multiple populations in many cases? Um, how do you make it an integrated... Uh, uh, eligibility experience, and so forth. So I said I would come back to efficiency, and there's a whole set of options, and of course there's no silver bullet here. What we did here, and the, the, the purpose of course is not to go through each and every uh, bubble, but if you think about you know, the, the, the options that we see states considering most frequently, if you think about uh, the savings potential uh, horizontally, and largest or most significant savings potential on the right, and then the time to impact, so nearest term impact at the bottom, longer term towards the top. You would love to find a whole set of big, uh, attractive options in the bottom right, so very significant and very near term. Um, the two that are there, however, around changing coverage or uh, changing provider uh, rates, have their downsides, right? And many states will consider them to be challenged in various ways. Now, it might be appropriate to make some adjustments in some states, of course, but in general, uh, these can be quite challenging. And so what we see states more and more doing is thinking about what is the right portfolio uh, of options to think through. So uh, uh, Mark McClellan talked about the top right, you know, the shift from fee-for-service to value-based payment. Um, if you look at some of the options on the left-hand side, you know, number four, optimizing payment integrity or program integrity. Uh, number six, uh, making sure that you're really, uh, really enhancing utilization management. There's a whole set of options here, and uh, as we look ahead, um, we see states uh, trying to very deliberately consider what is the right balance program that is uh, in total significant enough, but is balanced across those timelines. And then fourthly, 
Um, what does all of this mean for states' capabilities and talent? And we see four major sets of priorities for the Medicaid agency uh, of the future. So just to briefly list them, and I'm sure we'll get more into the discussion here. You know, at the top left, we, we do see state agencies being asked to do more and more in terms of charting a strategic direction. And that's across everything from, you know, the future vision uh, for what they do as a whole towards setting a clear LTSS or behavioral health strategy. Um, the blue on the top right, executing efficiency, uh, efficiently sorry, and effectively um, for what's left that you're not directly just giving to uh, managed care. Um, how do you make sure that that is running as smoothly, efficiently, effectively as possible? Um, bottom left, how do you measure the effectiveness and efficiency of what's being done uh, in your name? And then at the bottom right, building the organizational capabilities and the uh, culture and organizational health to be able to carry that out efficiently. Um, and so we see state leaders thinking more and more deliberately about what is the future shape of the organization along those four sets of dimensions. So that's a brief framing uh, of the issues, and I'll now hand over to uh, Aaron to introduce uh, the panelists. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aaron McKeithen. I'm uh, pleased to bring you greetings from the Duke Margolis Center. There are staff members uh, in the room and upstairs. Uh, this is uh, my second week on the job, so I can't tell you I'm an expert in everything that we have going on at, at, at Margolis. But I will say, uh, so far, uh, I'm very impressed by uh, the aspiration and, the, and the, the reality of bringing together the best uh, clinical leaders uh, the best healthcare economists, the best health services researchers, to try to make as practical an impact on uh, healthcare policy as possible. So I hope you'll get to meet some of the folks on the team, and, uh, and, and we invite you into the work and uh, as we as we move forward. So my job today is to tee up these ex exceptional uh, panelists and, and ask them a few questions, and then tee up questions from all of you. So we're now shifting to the discussion uh, part of the of the day. Let me just introduce who is sitting to my right, your left. All right, first, you just heard from Tim Ward, who is a senior partner at McKinsey and Company uh, based in Southern California. Tim has uh, nearly two decades of experience in the management consulting uh, arena. He oversees McKinsey's work in Medicaid. So uh, as we uh, talk about what states are thinking about, what they're doing, uh, few people here have uh, as good a perspective on that as, as Tim as he interacts with uh, state leaders. Uh, Medicaid is a team sport, as you know, and uh, so fittingly, Tim uh, uh, brings also a range of experiences uh, uh, from uh, pers and perspectives from payers, from providers, from pharmacy, pharmaceutical benefit managers, and from manufacturers that hopefully he'll bring to the discussion today. Thank you, Tim. Um, second, Jason Helgerson uh, has served since 2011 as the Medicaid director for a very small New England state. Um, just kidding, uh, the state of New York, um, which means he oversees healthcare services and programs for about 6.2 million people with an annual budget uh, north of $60 billion per year. Um, I just learned uh, in the, uh, right before the conference started that he is, you're looking at the longest continuously serving Medicaid director in America. Let's give him a hand for that. <laughs> How many years total? Uh, 10, over 10. So Between New York and Wisconsin. So 10 years, what's the average Medicaid like director? Like two years or something like that? So he's an overachiever already. We thank you for being here uh, very much. Uh, Jason has um, won a range of awards on innovation and government, um, and as he mentioned, um, has similar roles in Wisconsin. You can read more in your packets. And finally, uh, we're really pleased to, uh, to have with us today Tom Barker, who is a, a partner and co-chair of the healthcare practice at Foley Hogue here in DC. Uh, Tom is who you call when you have really gnarly questions about complex federal and state healthcare legal and regulatory matters. Um, he's got expertise in both uh, Medicare and Medicaid as well as exchanges uh, and the like. And uh, before um, the, his current role, Tom was uh, acting general counsel of the United States Department of Health and Human Services here in Washington and uh, was general counsel at CMS. So we've got quite the, the team here um, uh, we also have quite the challenge of, of, of all of you, which is a, a group of people who are no doubt above average in your knowledge of, of healthcare and healthcare policy. So I've asked the, each of the panelists to start out, and we'll just start here and go down uh, by telling you, you something you don't know already 
about Medicaid. So we'll see see if we can stump anybody just to get us started. You want to start with me, Jason. So, um, what is it that uh, we don't know about? I, I would say, not to critique your earlier presentation, but that slide that showed the variation by state on per recipient spending, if you note the time period, it was 2000, 2011. But if you looked at, and I haven't actually seen the data yet, um, eventually it will come out, it's always lagged. But uh, per recipient spending in Medicaid uh, throughout this last decade actually has basically been going down nationally. Uh, the Great Recession um, has forced Medicaid programs. I mean, Medicaid is the last of the great uh, economic shock absorbers uh, that's really left in the sense of that and, and food stamps. Uh, and the challenge is that uh, when the economy tanks and state revenues um, are, are suppressed, uh, the demand on the program grows. And so states all across the country, even those who didn't do the expansion, uh, saw their enrollment grow. Uh, ours grew when I started as Medicaid director in New York in 2011. We had about 4.3 million people on the program. Uh, we now have over 6 million people on the program. Yes, we're an expansion state. But our per recipient spending is now about what it was in 2000. Um, and so we've had no choice, and I think states across the country have had no choice but to get more efficient. Now there's clearly more that can and must be done, uh, but that would be my little factoid. Excellent. Yes, uh, so I would, I would just build on the, uh, the point I was making towards the end around uh, uh, capabilities and talent. So uh, interestingly, just in the last month, two different uh, Medicaid directors posed to me the question, you know, we, we're, we're working towards uh, getting the last parts of our programs into managed care. And so what does that mean for us that, is, uh, that, that we do as an agency? And um, it does demand a lot of uh, different kind of thinking and uh, actually the, the, the uh, challenge as well as the opportunity of really changing um, both the capabilities you have and how do you measure and manage uh, what you're doing or more importantly now what others are doing on, uh, on your behalf um, becomes super important. And I just don't hear that uh, talked about publicly as much as I think I do in, um, in private with Medicaid directors. I would... I would say, uh, so we all know, everyone in this room knows that two years ago, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid. <clears throat> President Johnson signed the two statutes together, Title 18 and Title 19 of the Social Security Act. If you printed out President Johnson's signing statement, it would be two and a half pages long. Just take a guess how many words of that signing statement were devoted to Medicaid. Four words. Mm -hmm. There is a sentence in the middle of the signing statement where he said, this law will bring the healing promise of modern medicine to the elderly and to the poor. That's it. That's all he said about Medicaid. And look at the Medicaid program today. The Medicaid program is the largest health insurance program in the United States. It is by far the biggest public health insurance program. It exceeded the size of Medicare. I think at some point during the time that I was working for the Bush administration, more people were on Medicaid than Medicare. And now with the expansion in the ACA, it's north of 70 million people. And so I really do think it's an important, you know, I remember as, uh, as a, a young congressional staffer in my 20s, first getting involved in healthcare and learning about healthcare. And people always thought Medicaid was just sort of this throwaway program that no one really understood, maybe with the exception of Congressman Henry Waxman during the 1980s. But no one really understood Medicaid. And now anyone who's involved in healthcare law, healthcare public policy, understanding Medicaid and being able to work with the nuances of Medicaid is crucial. Great. How many of you knew any of those things? A few. Uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that introduction. So I want to start um, in, in deep wonk mode here, Tom, with you, uh, because the new administration uh, has talked about and has indeed issued a letter to the governors about uh, signaling a desire for states to have greater flexibility uh, and carrying out the benefits and, and the like payment. Uh, can you start before any of that actually becomes? Uh, reality, give us a sense of what the waiver structure looks like today, uh, even before that, and comment on that letter and what you think it means. So Section 1115 of the Social Security Act gives the Secretary of HHS, delegated to the Administrator of CMS, authority to waive any provision of Section 1902 of Medicaid, which is the are the general operational requirements of the Medicaid state plan and Section 1903, which is generally the financing mechanism of Medicaid. 
The Secretary has authority to waive any provision of Section 1902 and 1903, which is really almost all of the Medicaid program. To the extent that she determines, the CMS Administrator determines that doing so would improve the efficiency of the Medicaid program. So enormous power to the Secretary of HHS and CMS Administrator to waive the basic rules of the game. The courts pretty much uniformly agree that that authority cannot be questioned by the judicial branch, that if the Secretary makes a determination that a particular waiver promotes the objectives of Medicaid, then a court won't second guess that judgment. I think I wanna maybe sort of go back to a point that Mark was making, which was the, the need for going to those phase three and phase four on that slide that he showed. Delivery system reform in Medicaid, I think, is just as important, if not more important, than delivery system reform in Medicare. And 1115 is waivers are the pathway to achieve that. Um, so you look at the waiver that Governor Baker got in Massachusetts before this administration took office, which really is designed to convert the entire Massachusetts Medicaid program, with some narrow exceptions, to an ACO type model. And I really do think that this administration is going to aggressively make use of waiver authority to encourage states to make shifts in their delivery system reform, both, both payment reform and also uh, to incentivize alternative payment models in Medicaid. Yeah. So Jason, can you pick up the story there and, and bring us up to speed on what's been going on in New York, uh, taking advantage of these waivers, and then any comments you have about the letter and what do you think it might mean going forward? Sure, so that. New York um, has a long history with 1115 waivers and in fact, I would argue today that the most important governing document for the New York Medicaid program is our 1115 waiver, which is now entitled the Medicaid Redesign Team Waiver. And uh, it governs our entire Medicaid managed care program, which is basically the primary delivery system for the program and was further amended uh, back in 2014 to create our delivery system reform efforts, uh, which is a $7 billion investment, uh, mostly federal funds, into the healthcare delivery system in New York State. Uh, the goal of that is to integrate care, uh, to create ACO-like organizations all across the state, uh, to get uh, more uh, cost-effective care, better outcomes at lower costs. Also, a big part of that is our move to value-based payment. So federal government said if we're gonna invest additional funds into New York State, we need you to move to value-based payment, not tomorrow uh, all at once, but by the end of the waiver period, so basically by the end of, our, of the decade, we have to have 80% of our reimbursement, and this is, remember, a $60 billion enterprise has to be value-based. So it's a major structural change that we're in the midst of, um, uh, but that, that is the, you know, the, the freedom that that gives is the ability, one, for that upfront federal investment, um, but then also um, it gives us the ability to really drive uh, the delivery system uh, into a value-based payment, which affects not just the Medicaid program and the Medicaid population, but the population as a whole. The one thing I would say, and, and back to that point, is, is that was interesting with the Obama administration was we sort of had ebbs and flows relative to their views on the 1115. Actually, in the last uh, year or so, two years, uh, that almost was a a view that uh, waivers were, were less than the ideal way to uh, sort of govern and regulate the program from a federal perspective. It'd be interesting to see if the Trump administration changes that perspective. Um, but I do think one of the challenges that they have is there's uh, what one appointee within CMS officially, some within the secretary's office. Uh, they're gonna be coming into a bureaucracy that's been going sort of in one direction for a number of years. Uh, one of the challenges, and Matt Salo from NAMDI's in the audience we talked about, is almost two audiences that Medicaid directors have to talk to. One is the political leadership, uh, mm -hmm. who talks a lot about um, uh, giving flexibility, but then also is the bureaucracy itself, which is vast and uh, and very deep. And uh, and I think the question will be, do, do those two sort of get completely on the same page? Uh, if so, how long does it take, and, and what does that same page look like? So Tim, maybe you can pick up the story there, scanning back out beyond New York, other states that, that are reading that letter and thinking about what they wanna do in their programs. Uh, what are you hearing from, from other states as to what they really want from Washington at this moment of uh, Medicaid uh, reform? 
Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think there's a, a mixture of, uh, you know, you, you want some stability, you also want some flexibility, I think is what we hear a, a lot. And going more into the flexibility point and maybe picking up from what Jason was, uh, was describing, um, there's several aspects of flexibility, as I illustrated earlier. One of them um, that, of course, is, is, is getting a lot of momentum at the moment, people asking a lot of questions around is uh, personal responsibility. And if you just unpack that a little bit uh, into how, what does that mean for states. So um, one is um, that could be all kinds of ways to support healthy behaviors. Um, some states have, uh, have made some initial progress uh, on that. Uh, secondly, how do you encourage uh, individuals in the moment of choosing care uh, to make value-based decisions? Um, really, you haven't seen a lot of experimentation there compared with what might ultimately be, uh, be a possibility. If you think about what could be tech-enabled um, and information uh, transparency and how that could help, there's an awful lot of uh, possibilities that uh, you know, I think we see uh, states just starting to ask the questions about. Um, and then the third is uh, how do you link all of that to you know, personal responsibility incentives uh, themselves, and not for uh, me or anyone else to judge, is it, is, is it right to have things like work requirements or not, but we certainly hear um, a lot of states uh, either going down that path already or, or considering it. Um, I think the final thing to say is, uh, you know, you, you, you might actually start to see some of these different uh, types of objectives being linked together. Um, so it might be considered by some states to be a good thing in itself uh, to encourage personal responsibility through one or more of the three methods I just mentioned. Imagine if you could link that to improving the experience of enrollees and to improving efficiency and so forth. I mean, there's some, some really interesting ways in which you might start to be able to get, you know, double or treble uh, uh, duty um, across those different objectives from some uh, innovations. One of the uh, important characteristics of Medicaid, of course, is that Medicaid isn't just Medicaid. It is a, a, a set of programs for very diverse sets of populations from the low-income children, pregnant women, uh, in some states, adults without disability, seniors. I wonder if you all, as we shift to talk a little bit about payment and delivery system changes, can comment on what you've seen uh, uh, and what you're most proud of out there in the states in the payment and delivery system arena, particularly for uh, patients with co complex health needs uh, with reliably high cost uh, expenditures. What works and what, what have you seen in that arena? Um, I can start. Um, in terms of, I, I was asked a question, this is sort of the question a little bit before, in terms of what I'm seeing now just in New York but in other states. I think there's a lot of interest uh, in value-based payment, uh, certainly the Obama administration with their focus on this. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, the Secretary's top priority, pushed it aggressively nationally. A lot of Medicare changes, I think, got a lot of people's attention. Um, uh, and, uh, and that momentum, a lot of Medicaid programs either helped push along or even just rode on the coattails of that. But I think there's a, a number of states across country, red and blue, who've moved in the direction of value-based payment. But I, I think the more, uh, as I sort of take a step back and think about it, um, and even my own trajectory as a Medicaid director in terms of how I think about the job now versus when I first started, um, I remember when I first started, people thought about, it was still somewhat controversial to talk about the uh, social determinants of health and whether the Medicaid program should care about things like um, uh, housing or other things, but I think we've moved beyond that. But also I think what's changed is the role of government, particularly the state government, in helping to drive delivery system changes. Uh, when I started, I definitely thought of myself as somebody running a particular payer and really focused on lowering costs just for um, our program and making sure that it was sustainable for taxpayers. But I think now um, states are uniquely positioned, particularly as the federal government's uh, role as a, as a driver is a little bit unclear. I think states need to decide, do they want to help lead the effort around delivery system uh, transformation? And I think that the answer for many states is going to be yes, even for red and, and blue states. And the reason I say that is because the problem in a multi-payer world is it's difficult for those payers and providers uh, to meet, to discuss, to have conversations that maybe in their collective best interest, but because of antitrust concerns, you know, puts a chill into any of that type work. And they really the only entity who can convene those efforts uh, are, uh, are is the government, uh, is state, uh, or maybe in some cases local governments. And so I think at the end of the day, whether it's driving it as a payer, as a regulator, or even just as a convener uh, to try to create a safe harbor for conversations around delivery system, 
I think that's part of the reason we haven't seen the kind of innovation in healthcare. The statistics were pretty clear from the earlier presentation is that in this multi-payer environment, even a forward-looking payer or forward-looking provider will sometimes get punished in the marketplace for trying to be out ahead. And I think one of the things that states can do is to help set either in regulatory payment policy-wise or even, as I said, as a convener, to try to get a collective vision for how to move the delivery system forward in ways that will lead to more efficient outcomes. And I think that gets to the point that one of the earlier speakers made about the need for integration of Medicaid with other payers in a state. And you see, I, I, I seem to keep belaboring the Massachusetts waiver and the Massachusetts experience, but just uh, a few weeks ago, the Secretary of HHS in Massachusetts sent a letter to Seema Verma and Secretary Price taking them up on the letter that you referenced him. And, um, and uh, I, I think that um, she made the point that there is a great need in Massachusetts to, uh, to have more integration between private plans and Medicaid. And the reason that I think she's taking that position is that Massachusetts saw a huge increase in Medicaid enrollment and a uh, concomitant decline in private plan enrollment over the past couple of years. And their, uh, the administration is trying, to, is trying to rebalance that. And so I think that that sort of gets to the point, Aaron, that you were making earlier about yeah. integration. Sure. Yeah, I wonder if, if any of you could comment on uh, the sort of the threshold of evidence necessary in the Medicaid arena to embark on new payment reforms. And I'll just say as by way of comparison, uh, the Affordable Care Act included statutory language and then regulation that made it very clear what happens if the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation tests a model, develops evidence uh, that's certified by the Office of the Actuary, and that those kind of programs can, can proliferate th across the program without further congressional action. Um, at the state level, within a Medicaid arena, lots of discussions uh, from state to state about different uh, payment delivery system reforms, but what kind of evidence do legislators need to be comfortable with uh, uh, and uh, administrators of these programs to, to, to take on uh, new payment delivery system initiatives in that way? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think Medicaid, uh, because it is under such fiscal stress, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, legislatures have to appropriate money each year or each, every other year as part of the budget process for the program. So there's constantly a pressure every year to try to control costs. So I think in that environment, I think mm -hmm. Medicaid programs maybe have uh, a mandate, so to speak, to actually try to things that uh, others may uh, follow on and, and potentially learn from. In our case, um, about a third of our current provider payments are value-based today. Some of these are providers who've been in the value-based payment business for a decade. Uh, so we do have some history. And as Mark mentioned, with the, in, you know, on the Medicare side of the equation, which I could critique a little bit some of their approaches, but um, it's been mixed. And we've had some, some, some successes and some not that great successes. But I do think that there's a growing evidence of the different types of payment models. Uh, that people can use and different types of risk uh, management, risk sharing uh, that can be done and how people can phase into riskier type arrangements. What I do think is a, a little bit uh, more challenging is building an evidence base around, okay, so now I'm in a value-based payment arrangement. What do I do differently to lower costs or at least control costs for the population I'm serving? Uh, and, and sometimes you'll hear about some great thing that was tried in one particular community, but the question is, can you replicate that exact thing in this environment, in this community? Uh, is it, in fact, scalable? Um, those, I think, are still some of those questions, particularly in Medicaid, where most of the cost is being driven by a subset of, pop of patients whose needs far transcends their health care. I mean, and, and you need to embrace those social determinants the example I give of one of the more creative things that we've seen was Montefiore Hospital System, uh, health system in the Bronx, uh, went into value-based payment arrangements. Uh, they looked at their COPD patients and saw uh, pretty high ER utilization, in, particularly in the summer months. And uh, when they did a root cause analysis, uh, actually talking to the individuals who are frequent ED visits and actually plotted out uh, when they were going to the ED, they found that uh, you could have a very high correlation between the spiking of the temperature uh, and when people were going to the emergency room. Why? Chronic lung disease becomes very difficult to breathe uh, in hot weather, particularly if you have no air conditioner. 
And what they decided was for $250, it was cheaper to buy a window air conditioner and to put it, install it into someone's apartment than it was uh, in their payment arrangement for that individual uh, to constantly be cycling through the emergency room. So remember, that's a hospital system that is making that targeted investment. Uh, and you know, in an environment where under fee-for-service, no incentive whatsoever to uh, slow that, uh, that flow of revenue through your, through your hospital emergency room, but in a payment arrangement, uh, it could be done. So I think there are things out there. We need to test things. And I, I also agree with Mark's earlier comment, which is we need to study these things. We need more research in this area so we can pick out these best practices and, and try to replicate them. And if I could just give another example, mold remediation as a means of asthma pre prevention, which is another social determinant of health. I am familiar with uh, an initiative where investors are willing to invest in mold remediation in low-income housing as a means of obtain obtaining savings in the healthcare system, preventable ED visits for asthma for kids. And so just three quick things to add to, add to that, which I uh, broadly agree with. So, so first of all, I think, I think states, uh, whether it's the executive or the legislature, have, uh, have, have a choice, right? Do you, do you start with a pilot and start small and eventually build up and sort of wait for full-scale demonstration that something is working? Or do you say, well, actually, across uh, all the different uh, uh, first movers that we've seen in the last several years, there really is enough evidence that uh, some of these new uh, activities really can work and work well and work at scale. And so you move yourselves to scale. Something every state should think about and decide for itself. But we certainly hear more and more states uh, on the latter uh, part of that. Um, secondly, what that doesn't mean is that it's a one-size-fits-all uh, model. Um, very important to take a look at things like the provider market structure, what's going to work for providers and the way that providers uh, function and manage themselves and uh, uh, their scale and so forth uh, in, in any individual state. And in many states, you've got to think individually, by the way, around the different geographic regions because they might look quite uh, different. Um, and then thirdly, I strongly agree with everything that's been said around uh, state leadership. It's really important. The state can be a very galvanizing force. What that doesn't mean and can't mean is uh, central planning. And uh, the kinds of innovations, whether that's uh, mold management or uh, air conditioning, um, I imagine would not uh, ever have been designed by central planning. So you have to leave room in your models for the kind of bottom-up innovation that can be so valuable along those lines. We have just a few minutes remaining in the panel. I'll have uh, one more question, but I would like to invite anyone who has a question for the panelists to take advantage of these microphones. I think Matt Salo will go first on that microphone. I know you have a question, Matt. Um, uh, <laughs> putting him on the spot a little bit. So if, you have, if you have a question, come on up um, to, the, to the mic. Uh, and while they're doing that, let me just ask one more question about um, uh, what's unique about states and the challenge of balancing uh, biomedical innovation, new, new drugs and treatments that happen to be really expensive and also drivers of, of uh, inflation in Medicaid, uh, but, 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 uh, but have huge clinical benefit uh, long term for states. How are states thinking about that uh, difficult balance? It, right now, it's by far the biggest driver um, of expense in our program. Our, Year-on-year year, uh, uh, gross drug spend is growing at about a billion dollars a year. Um, it is consuming. We, we function within a global spending cap, uh, which is tied to the medical portion CPI. We've been in that environment. It's a state-imposed cap. It's an environment we've been in for, for six years. We've lived within that. It's part of the reason why we've reduced our per-recipient spending. But right now, basically, that entire allowable growth is going into the mm -hmm. pharmaceutical expenditures. And, um, and so, as I say, it's, and I've, I've been around long enough to have lived the earlier years when you had the Lipitors of the world and you had these high volume, high cost drugs that, that were the drivers of the medical expenditures and then they all were going generic and it was a, a very good period from a health, from a spending standpoint and now with hepatitis C and, and some of the other, uh, uh, you know, cancer drugs and others, it's, it's now the reverse. But I do think that it's one of those issues uh, that we are trying to grapple with. I think it's going to be. Um, but that said, I mean, is there um, opportunities? Is there uh, some of these treatments? Hepatitis C is a perfect example. Horrific disease we now have a cure for. And we can cure it in, t like, what, 12 weeks. Um, it's just amazingly expensive uh, and hard for payers, including state Medicaid programs, uh, to fund that. But I, I do think, and I think this is interesting for any of you, uh, we, I've had some conversations with manufacturers. One of the benefits of New York is uh, we have the city of New York. It's a lot of corporations based there. Uh, I had some interesting conversations with some manufacturers around the move to value-based payment 
And is there an opportunity? We use the phrase skin in the game. And it usually refers to patients, um, uh, and in our case, poor, poor individuals having skin in the game. But, um, uh, but is there an opportunity for manufacturers to put some skin in the game? Right, where they actually put their money where their mouth is. Is this really a new innovation that's going to lower cost total? Uh, and if so, are they willing to take a risk with a payer uh, and with consumers and taxpayers and, and collectively all go in? I, I think it's interesting because I see the benefits of the new technology. I see the benefits of the new medications. But I fear greatly is uh, it all of our cost, you know, the availability, the money that's in the system for each year. Uh, going uh, to, to the manufacturers. I would just add to that that I do think your point argues for rethinking the Medicaid prescription drug rebate statute. It has really not been revised or modified since the early 1990s, and I really do think that to some degree, I think the, the best price statute limits the ability of manufacturers to enter into value-based purchasing arrangements. Sure. And and I, I sort of had this theory for six to nine months or so that um, Congress really should reconsider and rewrite the prescription drug rebate statute because it has not kept up with innovations in pharmacy management that have occurred over the past couple of decades. That's great. With that, we have time for uh, one or two questions. For those on the webinar, if you don't mind just identifying yourself and tell us where you're from and then ask your question. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. I'm a primary care physician. I'm from Bethesda here. Uh, with regard to uh, population health, uh, it seems like you're putting all the responsibility uh, on the patient, the consumer, uh, to resist um, billions of dollars of advertising um, and food engineering to make it taste just perfect with fat, sugar, and salt. Um, imagine if we had done tobacco control this way. Uh, the individual physician or someone else talking to the patient, telling him uh, not to smoke, um, but he could smoke anywhere he wanted. There would be no restrictions. There'd be plenty of advertising because it's a wealthy industry. And imagine what our smoking, the smoking rates would have been in that case. Uh, fast food is a good example. Uh, if we limited uh, the advertising, for instance, it might make it easier for the single individual to reduce this the billions of dollars of advertising that's pointed straight at him. Any comments from anyone? I agree. I mean, I, I think that the challenge is that uh, health care is not provided and Medicaid programs don't operate in a vacuum. We operate in a broad, very complex economy. and. Um, and you know our population, and uh, you know food, fat, fast food is a good example where you have uh, people wonder why obesity rates are high amongst uh, people on the Medicaid program. And when you actually dive into the root cause, you look at the neighborhoods in which they live. They look at what food options are available, and many many individuals live in food deserts where there is very little healthy food, and what is available is things like um, fast food. And um, so as a result, and it's cheap, it's convenient, they live complex lives with lots of demands on their time. And so uh, not surprisingly, it becomes a pretty convenient way to feed your children. And I, I think that's, um, you know, I think in some ways we need to better appreciate that and think about that. That's why I think Medicaid directors, um, uh, we, we need to spend more time thinking about what really are the root causes of things like uh, uh, um, uh, higher obesity rates, uh, pre -di the growth in pre-diabetes, those things, and um, so I, I agree. I guess I just I agree. With you. Um, this is this is a national thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it's fair to um, put all the responsibility on individuals when they have huge corporations uh, trying to do the opposite. Well, thank you very much for those comments. Indeed, uh, if we know anything about healthcare, it's going to take uh, more than any individual stakeholder to make progress in the context of Medicaid. We're talking about a, a system uh, that we spend over a half trillion dollars a year uh, for about 75 million people. So our challenge together is to figure out how to make that sustainable uh, and deliver the greatest value for the most people. So um, with that, thank you to our panelists. Join me in thanking them, and we'll... Um, transition to the next.
improving the individual insurance market. As you all know, this has been a major topic of uh, political debate here in Washington. We're going to try and, uh, just like in the last panel, tell you some things you haven't heard before uh, around both uh, what can be done to stabilize the individual insurance markets in cases where they're not functioning well now, both state and federal roles and private sector roles, uh, as well as steps that can be taken through individual market reforms, again, to, to drive improvements in the way that healthcare works and improvements in the health uh, of the individuals served. So for this panel, uh, we're going to start with some opening uh, uh, remarks and presentation, uh, brief presentation from Erica Hutchins Co, partner uh, at McKinsey. Um, by the way, the bios, the very extensive bios on all of our panelists are in your books, so I'm not going to spend time on that here. Uh, then we're very pleased to be joined by Peter Lee, uh, currently the executive director of Covered California, and Dennis Mathis, the president of the central region and the president nationally uh, of exchange uh, strategy for Anthem. Uh, so uh, Erica is going to be starting in, uh, uh, starting in, ready? Uh, come on up. Similar disclaimer as Tim mentioned, we are up here not to share policy advice, but to give some fact-based analyses and overview. So I think this will be a really interesting panel. Um, I'm just going to share a little bit of a fact base to ground the discussion before we jump into things. There are four key findings that we wanted to highlight that we think are quite relevant based on a lot of the analysis that we've done to track what's been happening as the individual market has been unfolding. The first finding. Despite coverage gains, there are many that are still uninsured. So Mark presented some of these findings in the opening. 2017 OEP was the first year that plan selection totals declined. We have about 10 million consumers enrolled through the end of last year if you look at effectuated enrollment, but close to 40% of those eligible to purchase on the exchange still uninsured. Even among those that have been purchasing, we have a trend that has been increasing um, which some have referred to as payment stoppers of those who are enrolling, one in five have reported that they stopped paying their premium at some point during the year. Um, so, so real questions around the persistently uninsured and how to keep those who buy plans to stay enrolled. Second finding, though partially offset by tax credits, premiums have been rising. Here, if we just look at 2016 to 2017, the median lowest price silver gross premium increased 24%. This is compared to a single digit increase from 14 to 15 and roughly half the increase from 15 to 16. It is worth noting that subsidies do offset this increase for many exchange enrollees. About 80% of people on the exchange currently receive some type of APTC. However, those that are not subsidy eligible or in the off exchange market are seeing the full rate increase. Financial performance varies, but carrier losses do continue. This is one that has gotten a lot of press recently with um, release of some new carrier financial information. In aggregate, our estimates based on publicly filed carrier financials are that there's been $20 billion of losses across the industry in the individual market alone for 14, 15, and 16. It is worth noting that there's been a small portion of carriers each year that have consistently made money, so about 25 to 30%. There are some trends here, whether they be around offering narrower network plans or HMO-based plans that have come out in some of the data. There's also market-specific trends as well. Some markets have fared better than others. And then finally, choice remains, um, but carrier exits have been rising. I think it's interesting if we look at the data here. In 2017, there were a handful of new entrants, so there still are some new, new insurers entering into markets, but it's the first year that the overall number of exchange carriers dropped below that of 2014. One in five consumers across the country have access to only one carrier, and with some of the potential announced exits for 2018, that may rise. Now, just this morning, there was a, a payer in the news saying that they're considering expanding markets in 2018, which is interesting to hear and a nice kind of um, contrast to some of the exits. But there are some real questions, especially around what may happen from a legislative perspective, that could play into carriers financial um, carriers filing decisions in the upcoming days and weeks. So with this landscape, we wanted to talk about what can be done. 
from our vantage point, we see four different types of changes that could be made to the individual market. Now there is a, a paper we put out recently on this that we've made available to you all, so we won't go into too much detail, but we wanted to just introduce the types of changes. The thought here is that these are changes that could be taken at a federal level, at a state level, or through a combination of federal and state action. If we take the top left, changes that attempt to prevent gaming through loopholes and rules governing enrollment and payment. The notion here is trying to get back to the fundamentals of the intent of the law. What are the intents for how people should be signing up? A great example of this is the recently passed law, the market stabilization rule that CMS just finalized. There are some provisions of this that aim to change this be gaming behavior, such as tightening the special enrollment period, making it possible for carriers to collect unpaid premiums among those consumers that have stopped paying their premium during the year, um, and other such measures. So this is one type to just promote the appropriate enrollment in the market um, as one way to try to reduce some of the high claimants. On the top right, changes that restructure the form in which risk is pooled or external funding is applied. This is something as a theme that came up in several of the opening remarks this morning. I think Mark mentioned just the overall notion of reinsurance. We've seen this come up in some of the proposed legislation, whether it be applying some of the patient and state stability funds for reinsurance, whether some of the recent states that have sought 1332 waives, waivers for reinsurance, we think about Alaska or Minnesota. Um, and then there's also the more recently kind of second manager's amendment that was suggested, the invisible high risk pool. So a lot of different ways of trying to get to this notion of improving the risk pool in the market. Third, changes that encourage the remaining uninsured to move in. So we said on the last page, close to 40% of those eligible are uninsured. Why are they uninsured? We know that many of them are aware of the penalty. We know that many of them are making an economic choice to stay uninsured because they feel that current coverage is unaffordable. So what changes can we make to lower premiums in the market, bring more individuals in, and lead to a healthier risk pool overall? And then finally, changes that better align consumer and provider incentives. This is one that was also touched on um, by both Shabam and Mark earlier today. So if we think about this last one, this is the notion that in our current model, consumers are simultaneously overinsured and underinsured. And if we think about what that means, overinsured in that some of the benefits that qualified health plans cover are kind of some more of the low dollar routine coverage benefits, while there are in many cases very high deductibles which don't vary based on a consumer's ability to absorb cost or spend cost. So is there some way in this broader theme of personal responsibility that we could revisit how some of the benefits are structured and offered that brings more of this consumer accountability to light and better aligns incentives for providers, for payers, and for consumers. So I'm not gonna go through each of these actions, but we wanted to just put this list up as a thought starter, and this is also in the paper that we've distributed. Through each of these four buckets, there are potential actions that could stabilize the individual market. Now I think each one of these, it's useful to think about you know, is it an action that would really require federal action? Could it be done at a state level? Is it market appropriate for certain states? Um, but a, an interesting array where our, our view would be there isn't going to be one silver bullet, you know, one of these bullets that's really going to stabilize the market by itself, but rather a mix of actions across these four buckets that could really lead to a sustainable outcome. I think a, a few more points that I'll suggest on this page that I didn't raise on the last page. Within that last bucket, bucket number four, when we think about the role of consumer involvement, I think one interesting theme is that some of these themes can cut across markets. So we talked a lot about personal responsibility with the Medicaid panel. Well, it's also a theme that can come into play within the individual market when we think about principles for market reform. And it's not just about thinking about how benefits are structured, but also this notion that Shabam raised earlier of combining savings with insurance. So is there some way to add a savings vehicle that can really help to encourage um, you know, consumers to be spending their money more accountably. Then the last thing I will touch on before we jump into our panel, we did do some sizing of what could the impact be across these four buckets. On the first one, since a lot of this is around trying to promote appropriate enrollment um, and targeting the, those gaming consumers that may be higher cost, you don't really see as much of an increase in enrollment overall, but you do see an improvement in claims. We measured up to about 10%. Stabilized risk pools, 
you not only could see a reduction in costs, but you could also see an improvement in enrollment as a result of those lower costs. So a lot of what we've modeled here is kind of multi-year, year over year. So if you do lower the costs in the market, then you're able to lower premiums and bring more people in. Maximize market participation. This really depends on what the measures are that you're putting into place. For example, how if you are thinking about changing the penalty, how effective will it be? How will consumers respond to it? Um, you do have potential here to bring a lot of enrollment in and have some impact on costs. And then the final one, reducing costs through coverage redesign and payment innovation. That last bucket about the personal responsibility that we talked about. We do feel that through more of a dramatic change of benefit design, you could reduce costs up to 35% and have an Im impact on enrollment too. I think what's interesting across this is just the fact that it really is a combination of these that could have more of a compounding effect on improving the individual market. And as we get into some of the discussion, a lot of it does end up being market specific and is useful to learn from some states that have implemented things that have had successes so far and, and see what people have tried and what they haven't to see what solutions we can come to. <laughs> All right, Erica, thank you very much. I'd like to kick off the discussion uh, that Erica has teed up, uh, Dennis, with, with you. Um, your perspective, based on what you've heard here, on, on where we are, what the status of the markets that you're participating in, and some of the most important steps that could be taken by states or otherwise, not just to stabilize, but to achieve some of these goals of improved uh, uh, improvements in cost and efficiency and, and greater access as a result and sustainability as a result. Great, Mark. I'll, I'll make my comments in two buckets. First, uh, what do we need to do immediately to stabilize the market? And then perhaps some longer term considerations in terms of how we move the markets forward. And so I think first, you know, first imperative is the, the cost share. Um, you know, we have to know that that's going to be funded for the remainder of 17 and 2018. It's just it's a critical thing in terms of market stability. The, um, you know, the impact of not funding those, you know, Kaiser's come out with, we think, a pretty directionally good estimate of it would have an impact on premiums of roughly 20%. In addition to that, if you just look at um, the funding that would go along with that in terms of if everybody had to raise their rates 20%, it would actually cost the government more money in premium subsidies. I think Peter's done some work here as well on that. And so it really doesn't make a lot of sense not to, not to move that forward. I think secondly, um, what has come out in some of the, in the rule changes are, are good steps in the right direction. And so one, the increased um, personal responsibility with regard to the special enrollment periods. And so they have been tightened up, um, which is a good thing for the marketplace. The data that Anthem has is clearly every member that's enrolled during the special enrollment period um, has been a, a net deficit in terms of their um, financial metrics with regard to their performance, which you shouldn't expect in special enrollment periods, right? If people had been um, appropriately screened in terms of having, they, the theory is they should have insurance coming into a special enrollment period. That certainly has not been our experience. And so going in that direction is, is a positive step in terms of improving the market. There could be more that could be done there. And then uh, with the risk adjustment changes that are coming in 2018, the formula is now more balanced to where you actually um, can, it makes financial sense for insurers to actually increase the enrollment in younger, healthier individuals. It didn't under the old risk adjustment formula, and so I think that's going to be a benefit going forward as well. And then finally, the discussions around um, reinsurance or high risk pool, I think that is, is really needs to be pushed because I think that would go a long way in terms of allowing insurers to, to stabilize the market in the near term and perhaps provide a good base um, for the future. Long term, um, two things. One, I think the 1332 waivers, um, you know, I think as has been said in the previous conversation um, with Medicaid, I think the federal government is going to be more likely to, to push state advancement with 1332 waivers. They were probably a little bit too restrictive in terms of the requirements initially, but um, certainly the secretary has all the um, power to waive those going forward, and so I think there's an opportunity to look at that. And then I think um, really important is to allow for a little bit more flexibility in benefit design, um, which is going to require some rethinking around how we score the metal levels, um, looking at out-of-pocket maximums and so forth. But I, you know, it was interesting, um, and, and Erica touched on this, I think the, the idea of pay for performance, and we're a big believer in that at Anthem. There's a component to that, though, in terms of um, time benefit design 
to those pay for performance parameters that we're missing today in terms of really driving individuals to make the right best decisions in terms of affordable health care. And so allowing that convergence of, you know, working with providers on pay for performance, but then allowing benefit design to be tweaked to where we're actually helping individual consumers understand the value and benefit of that, I think is going to be really important to affordability in the future. Thanks, Dennis. Now, Peter, the experience out in California has been different from many other states. You and other experts have written a lot about this already. I wonder if you could highlight a, a few of the, the most important things from your standpoint, especially those that may have relevance to other states trying to uh, improve the function of their markets. Great. Well, thanks, Mark. And it's great to be here. And it's, uh, as a kickoff event for the Margolis <laughs> Center, I want to tip my hat to Bob Margolis for helping set this up at Duke. And it's a, I can't think of a better forum to do this on, talking about both coverage but also quality and value. So it's great to be here. Um, uh, I'm going to start by not talking just about California, because I think one of the, the early questions of the last panel is, what might you not know? You might not know, given what you've just heard, that for the vast majority of the nation, individual markets are stable and are working well. And, and that's, I just want to repeat that again. For the vast majority of the nation, individual markets are stable today and are working well. 30% of states, that's not the case. And virtually all states are at risk for not working well if things are destabilized by yanking cost sharing reduction subsidy money, which are in place, and changing penalties, which are in place, et cetera, et cetera. So the issue about stabilization, I think it's very important that we aren't talking about a ship that's sinking. We're talking about potentially putting holes in something that's largely working. And I want to give you some of the examples of that nationally, and then I'll talk about California briefly, is that 10 million Americans have coverage because of the subsidies. Those subsidies have brought in healthy people that are lowering costs to the 8 million unsubsidized. That was the design of the Affordable Care Act. It's largely working. Now, I agree that there's, there's benefit of reinsurance that could make it more stable. But the theory behind the Affordable Care Act in most places is working. Second, are plans losing money? And I, I think, Erica, your data's right, but also wrong in the sense of, yes, $20 billion, $20 billion is the number, lost over three years. But most of that was in 15, 14 and 15, less in 16, and S&P and Kaiser families say plans are going the right direction. And many plans that lost a lot of money were stupid. I hate to say it, but they priced badly, they didn't know the individual market, they went into regions, didn't know what they were doing, and they thought risk corridor programs would protect them if they screwed up. So they lost billions of dollars. In California, plans haven't lost money much. In year one, they were contributors in hundreds of millions of dollars to the risk corridor program. Last year, risk adjustments, you know, some plans got off, but have done just fine. So it's, it's, I guess, the starting premise I'd like to question. That said, uh, a couple things that I'd flag for the risk to stability going forward. Number one is the cost sharing reduction subsidies. This isn't a new thing. This is built in to help lower income people afford care when they show up at a doctor's office. It's a requirement in the law either to be funded directly in federal spending or by health plans raising premiums and it being funded through uh, tax credits by that amount going up. But if you do that and don't fund it directly, it is, as Dennis noted, it's going to cost the feds more and it's going to cause massive disruption because rates will go up 16 to 20 percent, people will be confused. But there's so much focus on CSRs, I'd be worried, that is not the biggest danger for stability. Bigger danger for stability? is the non-enforcement of the penalty. Now, I understand there's a lot of philosophical concern around the individual mandate, uh, which needs to be discussed. But until there's a replacement, uh, an effective replacement, non-enforcement of the penalty, which is right now sort of uncertain, um, would lead to mammoth increases in premium and huge reductions in coverage. Uh, Covered California is going to be releasing data on that tomorrow. So third, though, um, marketing. And I'm interested in, Erica, your note on what can be done to promote enrollment. I didn't see marketing on that. Health insurance has to be sold. Every single person in Cover California and in any exchange is putting their hard-earned dollars on the table to buy insurance. In many cases, they're getting huge help to do it. They're getting a major co-payment from the federal government to lower their costs, just like we who have employer-based coverage get through our employer and the federal tax system. Um, but so they get that help. But they're choosing to spend money on health care and coverage instead of housing instead of food, you've got to sell it. Covered California spends about $130 million uh, in this year to promote enrollment and outreach. Um, 
That isn't far off, I think, from the entire amount spent by the federal government to support enrollment in 35 streets in the federal marketplace. Um, if you aren't investing in marketing, you're going to get a bad rip. So that is an uncertainty. Uh, the final big one I'd note is really some of the bigger questions on where the Affordable Care Act is going, which is changing the nature of the subsidies themselves. Um, the subsidies as structured today are based on individuals' income, their age, and where they live. Um, and we could all talk about how to reform and restructure them to be more balanced and more fair and, and whatever, or saving more money to the federal budget. But restructuring the subsidies is the big down the road discussion. And note that whatever changes will either have winners and losers. And so that's the last one. With one last one, which is I do want to speak briefly to the issue of reinsurance, which is um, many markets are today, without being destabilized by taking away CSRs or removing the penalty, quite stable. Quite a few markets, about a third, are at risk, have one carrier that might leave. Having a risk stabilization fund delivered as a reinsurance product uh, to help uh, insurers be in would be a huge uh, support for lowering premiums and giving health plans in those 30% of the counties that have one plan to decide to stay in. Um, to my mind, that would be an incredibly reasonable investment of $15 billion as proposed in the American Health Care Act. Would actually only cost about $4 billion because it lowers the APTC. But it would lower premiums nationally by between 12 and 18% across the board, people with and without subsidies. And it would give health plans a comfort that they can be in it for another few years while things are settling out in Washington. So I think that I actually worry that the destabilization dangers of the cost sharing reductions are having all the discussion when the other things that could either destabilize the market or stabilize the market aren't getting nearly the focus they should. All right, thanks. So we've had a lot of discussion about some of the, the short and medium term federal steps that, that could have a big impact on markets. Um, I do want to um, turn to some of the longer term issues, Section 1332 and what states would do with more flexibility. Um, uh, Dennis and Peter, I know you all have also done a lot of work related to driving uh, delivery system reform, transparency, benefit redesign. I want to get to those, but first, uh, Erica, um, uh, comments, additional thoughts you'd like to add around these issues of, um, uh, if not market instability, maybe limited um, mm -hmm. participation in some markets, or fragility is a term I've heard a lot, and any other points you'd like to highlight that would be important to address that? Sure. I mean, I think your point that it, it isn't a nationwide thing, it, so if we think about carrier choice, for example, you take California, I think 75% of consumers in California have at least five carriers right. to choose from. So definitely some markets performing better than others. And none have fewer than two. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about carrier financials, one of the things worth noting is it isn't entirely clear if some of the recently released 2016 financials are taking into account reinsurance wear off. Right. Um, and they're still have, we don't have 100% of carrier financials out. Um, though we looked at the 2017 rate increases higher than past years, you know, almost twice as high. So there is a question of, you know, wh how much will those rate increases close the gap and, and are things moving in the right direction? I think that you um, did raise a really interesting point about marketing. Um, not only is marketing spend important when we look at all of our consumer research and the level of consumer confusion and understanding and some of the changes that have been discussed as potential reforms that may not have gone into place that could add to that consumer confusion, you throw into the mix, we will only have a six week open enrollment period now as part of the CMS market stabilization rule. So there is a question around who will be doing the, the consumer marketing and outreach and um, how much will be kind of up to states or up to payers, um, depending on you know how that has to play out. So I think that's a very important challenge that you highlighted. And I just to add on that. I, I absolutely agree with Peter. I think you know marketing is critical to the program in terms of um, general awareness. So I think you know two things could be considered. One, um, higher funding out of out of either the state or, or federal in terms of supporting marketing and general awareness, or considering and going down the path of the current MLR requirements for the industry. All of those um, expenditures for broker commission marketing are above the line consider moving those below the line, and that might actually help free up some funding from the industry as well to actually help drive, try to drive up participation. Can I build on that? Two things, if I could, Mark. One, um, 
average rate increase, and this averages are wonderful. You know, as you know, you can drown in, an, in, a, in a lake that on average is one inch deep. But so the 24% average rate increase in 2017. California had our biggest rate increase on average by four. It was 13% after two years running of 4%. Now, the actual experience of consumers was average about 10 to 11 because people shopping by lower product. Why was it almost three times as high in 17 and 18? In California, because reinsurance went away. So a one-time, one-year adjustment. In the rest of the nation, 35 states had a big chunk of their individual market still sequestered from a common risk pool because those states didn't convert all their plans to Affordable Care Act compliant plans. And I know this gets lost in wonk land, but it's actually important when you say healthcare is local, states that made tough decisions early on and said, everyone's gonna be in one risk pool, have done better. States that said, we're gonna allow everyone that was originally underwritten, meaning all unhealthy people were excluded or pre-ex were excluded from that pool and not be treated as a part of the common risk pool, plans didn't know how to price for it. So they screwed up, they lost money, and they recovered. Mm -hmm. Every plan that priced 24% or 30% or 40% for 17 did it on the assumption that going into 18, they would need to only price for medical trend. I mean, just this, I mean, there's, I know there's actuaries in the room, and I see at least John, is it, <laughs> is it, is it uh, no health plan priced in 17 on the assumption they would do 40% increases two years in a row. Every single plan priced in 17 to cover their total costs and have 18, which we're about to go into, being medical trend only. Every penny over medical trend is risk destabilization, either caused by bad federal policy or bad enrollment or bad marketing. So I want to be clear that the health plans are not in the business of losing money. They are not in the business of pricing to have future years be as bad as the last year was. So I think it's just a, we need to look back. The, the rearview mirror informs pricing. But California, we're absent uh, an uncertain world, which is that it's uncertain. We're looking for you know, single-digit premiums in 2018, as should every other state, absent the uncertainty we're all wrestling with, that health plans, I want to note, need certainty on in the next month. I mean, that's one of the things we're wrestling with is that the discussions we're having sound abstract and wonky. Next week, 11 health plans are submitting preliminary rates to cover California. In the next two weeks, you know, whatever it is, 530 plans across America are submitting their initial rates. And in the next six weeks, those rates are going to be locked down. And every health plan needs to have a certainty to decide if they're going to be bidding to have 40% because they don't know what the heck's going on, mm -hmm. or are they needing to cover medical trend? And that's a delta of from 7% to 60%. And Dennis, uh, maybe if you could add to this, uh, it's great to be a moderator for a panel that doesn't really need a moderator, but <laughs> I do want to move, move you all along before we wrap up into some of these longer term issues too. But before we do that, um, any uh, thoughts or any projections you'd like to make about premium increases next year? assuming that uh, the cost sharing reduction issue gets uh, What will your rates be so, for California there? So, so, <laughs> I am not prepared today to talk about um, rates for, for Anthem in the future, but I, I would like to expand on um, one thing Peter said, because it, it, it is, I'm, you've got me going wonky now too, Peter. <laughs> but, um, Sorry, Mark. Uh, uh, understanding that um, when, you, when you look at now the individual business, we're, we're pricing, as Peter said, for 2018 based on 2016 experience, but we still haven't finalized 2016 experience because we don't get the final R, so we don't actually find out what risk adjustment looks like until June of this year. And so the health plans are in a, in a very difficult situation right now with the timeline of the individual business in that we have our experience now, and that's pretty well ginned up for 2016, um, but we don't know what the final risk adjustment numbers are from the federal government. We've got some peaks into it because we're all trying to get as much um, front view as we possibly can but so you're pricing from back experience you're projecting that forward you don't have clarity on actually what that experience is until you've already have to submit your pricing for next year and on top of that you're trying to predict the changes in policy that are being discussed in Washington and the movement of which is pretty significant within the individual business right now we're seeing annual churn of roughly about 50% in our individual business. So now you're trying to project that churn factor in. It adds a lot of complexity. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of our actuaries, um, you know, gray up over the last two years <laughs> because, you know, you're really trying to take imperfect data 
from the past and then really project with a very, um, what I'd call fluid landscape in the future in terms of how that's going to work out. So it does create for some interesting dynamics when it comes to how do you price for that, price accurately, knowing that the balance is the more affordable your products are, the broader the participation is going to be. But at the same time, if you underprice and you're, putting, you're, you're continuing a loop that some, a lot of carriers have experienced in the past several years. It, it does seem like there is going to be some uh, fluidity or uncertainty in, in federal policy. Maybe some of these short-term issues will get resolved, but uh, at least a good chance that some of these uh, issues are not going to be fully resolved in the near term. Given all that, you all mentioned Section 1332 waivers. Peter, I know you've taken some steps or trying to take some steps uh, in California to, to try to put more of an emphasis on value. What would you like to see happen uh, un, uh, if states had more flexibility under Section 1332, or do you, do you need it? And uh, what would you suggest that the federal government do to help create more pressure for getting costs down and improving quality of care? So I, you know, I think you know, just going down the, the, the real quick list um, of things that I would think of, you know, first, I think, and it's been, it's been discussed, but taking the, the rating bands from three to one and at least moving those to five to one, which is going to help improve the affordability for younger, healthier individuals in the marketplace. I think that's an important consideration. We already mentioned reinsurance. I think reestablishing a reinsurance mechanism will help better benefit premiums and stabilize the market and probably encourage participation you know, in the carrier space with regard to that. You know, we touched on, and I, you know, I think looking at, um, looking at allowing states to really focus on what they've done historically, which is actually um, utilize you know, um, adequate network standards at the state level rather than the federal mandate. And I, and I say this because, again, I think um, the plans that have performed well, if you look at over the past three years, have certainly performed well because we believe they've had narrow networks in place and so they've been better able to control affordability. And so allowing for some more flexibility in terms of network standards long term probably translates into a more affordable, stable market. And then finally, as I, I mentioned earlier, I think really looking at you know allowing for some um, improvement in benefit design that or, or modification of benefit design that really allows carriers to to pair up pay for performance on the on the provider side with actually driving benefit design that encourages consumers to really utilize those pay so for it's performance. So not easy programs. to do that now. Well, I think you know you look at and this is something Peter and I have discussed in a previous panel, and we're not in quite alignment on. But I think one, I will say up front, I, I agree that the idea of metal levels is good for consumers in terms of simplicity of communication in the marketplace. I think that's a good thing, but I also believe there needs to be more flexibility with regard to that in terms of how you score things to allow for more flexible benefit design, and then certainly out-of-pocket um, regulations today limits in terms of how you score those out-of-pocket rules with regard to how you might look at um, some pay for performance. And the, the easiest example I could give is in, in, in a lot of our markets, there is a, a four to five-fold difference in MRI costs depending on the site that you would select to go that. So a really um, easy, I'd call it easy, but benefit design change would be to say, we're going we're gonna to pay for um, an allowed amount of X, and that X will cover... 30% of our network, you will have no out-of-pocket exposure member if you go there. But if you go to the highest cost facility, it might cost you $5,000 out of your pocket if you choose so to do that. The cost share rules that exist today and the out-of-pocket maximums really destroy that value creation in terms of trying to incent um, that consumer um, performance. So. That's where I, that's again an easy example in terms of how I would recommend some changes. Yeah, we'd like to hear from from Peter and Erica on this too. And uh, I think I've gotten in two questions uh, during this panel, uh, and I, we, we are running short on time. Uh, but but it's been a, it's been a good discussion from all of you. So please go ahead, Peter. Well, uh, just to spark things up and make sure Mark can't talk anymore is, to, <laughs> is one to agree and disagree with some of the things that Fenna said. Is that you know there's a lot of discussion about three to one to five to one. The, the age band ratios. Unclear if it really is going to help because actually what it does is dissuade older healthy people that spend a lot of money on premium from signing up to get some more young people. Unclear. Benefit design. A lot of the discussion nationally is about lower AV and not covering some things. I want to remind people that those solutions, copper, is not lowering costs. It's lowering who pays the cost and saying more should be paid directly by the consumer. 
That's a formula for, I think, more bankruptcies, et cetera, not necessarily better care. Benefit design that we have in California, patient-centered design, say no outpatient care subject to deductible. I don't want to write, I want to write everyone. Whenever you hear about a high deductible plan, ask what does the deductible apply to? And standard benefit designs fosters, just what we heard about the early presentation, of uh, demand-side competition. In California, there's demand-side competition. Consumers pick between Anthem, Kaiser, HealthNet, Molina, based on the value they're going to buy, the networks, uh, what that plan delivers, not some hokey-pokey co-insurance gobbledygook. Well, no, that wasn't what you were saying. Don't get me wrong. But, the, but it's, it's, consumers are shopping, and that's driving the plans to price better and have different networks that have different value. So let's get consumers in the game. The thing we haven't talked about much is, um, in the end, these elements are really small on really affecting healthcare costs. Healthcare costs isn't about benefit design, it's about what doctors, hospitals, nurses, MRIs, pharmaceutical costs are. And that's where, I mean, I'm, you don't need a 1332 waiver to be a purchaser like Cover California that says in our contract with every one of our 11 health plans, you need to be increasing what you do and pay for performance. You need to be channeling people and paying more for accountable care organizations, patient-centered medical homes, and integrated delivery. We're doing that aligned with CMS and Medicare. And I know, I mean, I, I used to work at PBGH, Pacific Business Group on Health, representing the largest private purchasers. 20 years we've been talking about getting health plans to align and pay for value. Right now, private purchasers are behind. Medicaid programs like New York are behind CMS, and they should be out front. Exchanges like Cover California and every other exchange, including the federal exchange, don't need a waiver to have contractual requirements on their health plans to push alignment and push delivery reform that get at that 30% waste. That, and California, we're a pretty big state. Northern California healthcare costs 30% more than Southern California healthcare costs. You don't fix that by an AV fix or by a little tweak of a copper plan. You fix that by pricing issues in terms of provider consolidation. You do that by actually rewarding better care. And uh, I'll turn to Erica next, and I think we're going to have time for maybe one or two questions if anybody wants to head for the, the microphone. Please go ahead. So I think that one important point that Mark has raised is while increased state flexibility is critical, and it is something that we've heard kind of communicated and promoted by the current administration as was mentioned on the prior panel, that there are a number of things that can be done outside of 1332 waivers, both at the federal and the state level when we look at um, regulatory discretion. So it's useful to take that very broad lens of what can we actually do from a change perspective. And then I think both Mark and Dennis touched on interesting points that in order to really lower the cost of care in the market, you do have to look at the supply side. And I think there's just the question of, can you actually change some of the pressure on supply side costs through benefit design change and somehow empower consumers as, as taking a role in that, which clearly is um, you know, yet to unfold and yet to be seen. What else could be done to foster transparency for consumers and also for mm -hmm. uh, healthcare providers who influence uh, uh, the choices of physicians and, and uh, influence the choices of patients in, in uh, deciding where to go? Well, can I, can I, uh, to speak that is again. Oh, yeah, uh, I guess so. I should get. I guess Mario is going to get a chance to talk in a few minutes, but uh, didn't see you. Yeah. yeah. Actually, why don't, why don't you go ahead, Mario? Yeah. So, Peter, this is this is for you. Dennis mentioned that we are, we have difficulty because the risk transfer issue doesn't get resolved until after we filed our rates. So not only are we looking back two years, maybe we're looking back two and a half years in a sense. Why can't we change the filing deadline? Uh, well, a couple things. One, uh, in California, we're working with all the plants, including Molina, uh, to provide flexibility of amending rates uh, through the end of June. And so you'll have the full data to be able to amend and update rates. Um, and that's really important. Part of the thing about the filing deadline, I work backwards not from a regulatory window, but from a consumer window. When do we need to have rates on the shelf for consumers to shop? And that's whether it's a state regulator or CMS, that's what we should all be doing, working backwards from filing to get on the shelf for consumers the information they need. So that's one. I want to come back to your other question, if I could, though, which is, um, mm -hmm. and I really appreciated the... Can I interfere oh. with your response only from both <laughs> Dr. Molina and... and uh, your mic's John, not on, John. Mr. Burtko. I'm not sure your mic's on, and oh. please introduce yourself quickly. Okay, mm -hmm. sure. John Burtko, I'm the guy that he points to sometime, mm -hmm. uh, a chief actuary. But for Dennis and for Dr. Molina, the interim results on risk adjustment for 2016 are out. They came out about three weeks ago. You guys have them. 
Uh, in the past, California didn't make that interim cut, but you know what you're doing now. You're ready for uh, rate submission, or you should be. If your guys don't think so, uh, tell them to call me. All right, we're, we're definitely in the weeds, but very important weeds in terms of details yeah. about what you're pricing against. So, uh, so um, but I do want to get back just one, uh, 30 more seconds on, okay. on transparency. transparency. It's, it's, I think mm. the introductory remarks were so important about the price variation for MRIs, et cetera. Covered California requires every one of our plans to provide tools for consumers specific to their network on price and quality variation of doctors and hospitals. Um, it's the right thing to do. We need to bring that information to the consumer level. And we start that the moment they enroll because when they're picking between their health plans, they're looking at price and quality. We've got stars up there on the quality stars for the health plans, and we've got price information that includes out-of-pocket costs. And that's the sort of thing we do need to engage consumers. But as purchasers, whether you're a Medicaid program, a state exchange, or the federal government, if we aren't telling the health plans to serve our consumers well, with all due respect, Health plans won't do it enough. So I think we need to be making sure that there's a level playing field for consumers that drives right down to the individual level of care. Dennis, what do you think would work best to create a level playing field for consumers uh, from a plan perspective? So I, I think one, uh, in general, I, I agree with Peter's comments around the meta levels. I mean, we've had this discussion. I think allowing consumers some visibility and simplicity in terms of how much out-of-pocket exposure can I um, expect to take on in the course of a year. I think the transparency tools, we're absolutely in support of transparency, both from a quality and cost perspective. I, I do think, um, you know, level playing field, and, and this is, is all in the eyes of the beholder, Mark, at the end of the day, is around what is a fair way to distribute both the subsidies that ultimately get applied and how you rate the different segments of the consumer population that you're trying to cover in a way that maximizes overall participation. And so, you know, three to one, five to one, you're absolutely right. If you go to five to one, older consumers will bear a bigger part of the cost to do that. But the question is, and it's an unknown question at this, how much of the current 10 to 12 million that are sitting on the sidelines do we get in by getting to more affordable prices? So, you know, at the end of the day, Dennis's formula for the future is really around, I think, a couple things. A little bit more flexibility in terms of benefit design, um, reinsurance to making sure that we have a reinsurance program that helps stabilize the market. And then I, I am 100% supportive and, and Anthem is around the idea of transparency, both from a quality and affordability standpoint. But then also, I think, benefit design to go with that, that actually encourages consumers to want to go out and shop for what is the best value for them in, in a given service line. Right. Well, this group could clearly go on for a while, but we're going to have to end it there and get on to an uh, excellent uh, panel coming up. I want to thank you all very much for joining us today. a lot of the discussions earlier on around uh, innovation at the state level for Medicaid, innovation around the input exchanges. And what you saw at the end of the last discussion was the private sector bursting forth with innovation around uh, how they are anticipating uh, the, the twists and turns of the marketplace and how they actually think they can bring their organizations forward. Uh, we're really, really pleased in this last panel to have uh, two terrific CEOs. I think your mic's not working. Your mic's not working. Oh man. Can you hear me at the back? Way at the back? They said it better when they couldn't hear me. What we'd like to do is introduce our
our two, uh, two final panelists. Uh, we have uh, Mary Molina. So Dr. Molina is the CEO of Molina Healthcare. Started in 1980. It's now an $18 billion MCO. Uh, presence across uh, 28 states and a lot of uh, diversification into various lines of business, certainly Medicaid, Medicare, and the exchanges, informatics business and the like. So welcome. Thank you. Join you. And uh, David, David sure. Feinberg, CEO of uh, Geisinger uh, Health Plan. And so again, uh, an organization with uh, an enormous track record of innovation. We talked earlier today, and I think it was actually maybe Jason talking about pharma and big pharma, could they put their money where their mouth is? And uh, Geisinger actually does uh, do put their money where their mouth is with their money back guarantee. So as we think about some of the shifts in the marketplace, how do we actually engage consumers? How do we actually get them to be participating, making smarter choices about their health, but then also how to and when to and where to access health care. Um, I think taking that bold stand and putting back a money back guarantee is an indication of where some of these organizations are going. So what we're going to try to do now is, is bring this back to um, innovation in the private sector. And, and, and I think the way we wanted to start this off was perhaps just thinking about how do private sector leaders uh, determine their priorities and strategies within a context of uncertainty. So perhaps if you think about the marketplace today, what do you think are the most important sources of uncertainty? And how does that impact the way you set your, your priorities and, uh, and strategies? Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, the, the most important, uh, greatest cause of angst and uncertainty right now is will the CSRs be funded? CSRs are cost sharing reductions that are used to um, help low-income people pay their uh, co-pays and deductibles. And one of the things that you, know, you hear a lot is that people have been concerned about the increase in the premium rates, but they've also, they don't like high deductibles. And so for about 70% of the patients that we take care of, uh, these cost-sharing reductions help cover their co-pays. So for example, let's say your co-pays $45. Yeah. Maybe the beneficiary pays 15, and the health plan will supplement that with 30, which goes to the provider. Those things are built into our contracts. There's a dispute right now between Congress and the administration, really started with the Obama administration, as to, to how those things were covered and paid for. The House Republicans sued, saying that they were not appropriated. They won. That case has been put on hold. And right now, the discussion is, will Congress appropriate the money as part of the continuing resolution. That's critical for 2017 and for 2018. That is probably the thing that's causing the greatest amount of uncertainty. And as Peter said, you know, we're trying to file our rates. It's probably a 20% pre difference in premiums. So, you know, do we file two sets of rates, one with, one without? I mean, how do we do this? And how do you plan? Um, and that is, is a huge bit of uncertainty and something that you know really should have been resolved by now. David, what do you see as the most pressing forms of uncertainty? So I, I want to just echo what Dr. Molina said, but I want to take a much uh, take a step further back. I mean, to us, our business is people caring for people, and and healthcare reform has been uncertain for at least 40 years, and we've been in business 102 years, and I think what we need to do is focus on how we make it easy when patients find out that their kid's suicidal, how we make it easy when a mom finds out the breast uh, mammography came back positive or an elderly parent falls down. I think our industry is so screwed up and it's ripe to be disrupted. And either we do it or some Stanford dropout in a black turtleneck is gonna you know, knock out our whole business. <laughs> so, so what we wanna do is really focus on value and uh, I think regardless of who's in Washington, D.C., healthcare reform starts in places like Shemokin and Danville and Scranton. And it's going to be, are we taking care of people in a way that's safe and dignified? Is it culturally sensitive? Can they afford it? Uh, is it high quality? Is it easy to get? Uh, and um, is, it, is, it, is it something that you'd want for your own family? And if we get that right, I'm certain that our organizations and other like-minded organizations will do well no matter what Washington does mm -hmm. to us. Because really when it gets down to it, um, for us as a health plan and a provider, we can't exit markets. These people in our neighborhoods are our people. We can't say we're not here anymore, right? So we need to care for them whether they're insured or not. We think the best way to take care of them 
is in a setting with a relationship with a primary care doctor. So, so with all this craziness going on, what we've said as a team is let's focus on value. Let's focus on high quality, great experience at low cost. And whatever happens, I think that positions, positions us for success. So when you think of all the opportunities for improvement uh, in, in the way that you've described, how, how would your team um, pick the priorities, where you'd even start around enhancing healthcare value? We talked a little bit earlier today about supply side drivers, demand side drivers. Um, where, do you, where do you get the start to get the momentum and then build from strength so, to strength. So we talk about four areas, and one is medical care. Uh, then we think it also matters what your genetic code is and what your zip code is, and we think it also matters whether you're rich or poor. And so for medical care, our focus is on access. It's all mm. about if we can make sure you get in to see your doc, we can avoid hospitalizations and ER visits. And that when you get in to see your doc, it's team-based and it's easy. As far as genetic code, we have the largest now biobank in the world. We're doing population health genomics in real time. So we've consented 160,000 people for whole exome sequencing, and we tell patients in advance, here's what's going to happen to you, and here's how we can prevent it. And then it also depends where you live. Um, so uh, Geisinger is a system that's pretty big in Pennsylvania, but there's other players. There's UPMC and Penn and Temple and Jefferson and Guthrie and, and Wellspan and uh, Hershey and Pinnacle, we're not 40% of the market. 40% of Pennsylvania lead hospital buildings are Geisinger's. We really believe that keeping the environment healthy is not only good for our business, but saves lives. And it decreases premature deaths, it decreases uh, asthma, hospitalizations, et cetera. And then we take diabetics that are food insecure and say, here's food for the whole week for you and your family every week. Mm -hmm. And we've seen decrease in hemoglobin A1C in every single patient, decrease in weight, decrease in, in blood pressure. Um, if this was a pill, it would be a, a miraculous pill. We have patients that we spent $220,000 on in four years before we started giving them food. In the year they've been in the program, our medical cost is $1,200. So I don't think it's innovative. I think Hippocrates talked about food as medicine a long time ago. I think we've lost our way. So when we prioritize, it's around medical care, it's around your genome, it's around your environment, it's around what we now to call social determinants of health. But when, when I was growing up, we talked about it being poor. Well, this is interesting because I think Jason also gave the example earlier today about Montefiore and understanding ER usage and uh, peak times around hot weather yep. and air conditioners. So this is this, this notion of just kind of follow the facts and, uh, and the solutions. Mara, any, any thoughts around how you think about the priorities, um, affordable quality, what, what goes to the top yeah. of your senior agenda? So, I mean, I want to I actually comment on something that he said, something I think you said earlier, which has to do with poverty and how it affects health care. Um, so much of what we do in this country has to do with the, what we now call the social determinants of, of care or health, and um, we look to the health care system to fix those problems. It really can't. Uh, you know, obesity is not something that you're going to cure. It's a public health issue. It really is. So a lot of our problems are now public health issues. There are different public health issues than we had 100 years ago when we had problems with sanitation. But nevertheless, unless we address those public health issues, we're going to continue to see very high health care costs. And you really can't expect the health plans to do that. So I, I do think we need to have a, a little bit of a shift in our thinking around what now constitutes public health. It's not just infectious diseases, but it's those social determinants of health and we as a society have to deal with that. Otherwise, we're going to continue to, to use these Band-Aid treatments through the healthcare delivery system, which really aren't very effective. Mm. Um, by the time somebody really gets in trouble as a diabetic, it's really too late. You know, we really need to be working on the front end. And you know, the idea of, the, of proper nutrition is really important. And obesity is an epidemic in this country. It really is. If, if we had an epidemic of influenza, we jump on it. We have an inf epidemic of obesity, and we just kind of ignore it. Yeah. So I think at the start of the day, Shabam talked a lot about smart regulation, yeah. smart policy, and how do we actually promote public interest and yet still leave room for private sector innovation? Maybe just to pick up your example of obesity, since it is so pressing, any, any even rough thoughts of how uh, payers, providers could collaborate with uh, public health officials, uh, with the regulators, with legislators? to try to tackle a pressing you know, social we, issue like that? We, we try. Yeah. You know, and we, we try to do something about obesity, but it's really difficult just from a health plan medical model. The medical model is really good at taking care of acute illnesses or managing chronic ones. 
But to get at the underlying root cause, I don't think the medical model works very well. And so I do think we need to, to shift the paradigm, probably invest more money and more effort into public health. And I think if we did that, we wouldn't spend so much money on health care per se. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I think it's uh, but something that we need to address because I don't think anyone else is going to address it. I think that uh, it's, it's really, we have these food-borne illnesses, when you think of our obesity, that we need to attack in the same way we would an infectious disease model. Uh, the opiate epidemic, I think 57,000 people died in Vietnam. Uh, that many people have died from opiate uh, yeah. overdose in the last couple of years in the United States. And uh, it's not an epidemic. It's been killing blacks and Hispanics for a long time. Now that it's killing white folks, it's all of a sudden, you know, we start talking about it. But for us, that means uh, we're going to prevent it from happening by making sure we don't give extra pills to patients. We're going to have other types of pain management. We're, of course, at the end of the line going to give Narcan to the cops in our town so they can bring people back. Uh, but really what that's about, I mean, if you really want to address those kinds of things, addiction, for example, is a disease of despair. And if you don't have a job and something you're looking forward to, uh, it, it's gonna, that's hard for us, although we're a large employer, to keep employing people. The last thing I like is when we're the largest employer in a town. That means it's not going well there. When the only restaurant to eat is in the cafeteria in our hospital, I know we got problems. So, so building an economy of people, giving them hope, is going to also help with opiate addiction. And that, that is difficult to do as a health system. So opiate addiction has gotten a lot worse, no question about it. But when I go back to the 1990s when I was a medical director and I was overseeing the pharmacy uh, benefits, I can tell you that the, one of our top drugs in Medicaid has always been uh, narcotics. So if you look at our top five, 10 drugs, you know, acetaminophen with codeine or something like that is always in the top often like number three for our Medicaid population. So it's, it's getting a lot of attention now, but it's an old problem. It's been around for a long time. And, and we, the pendulum swings back and forth. So for a while, physicians were not adequately treating pain. And I had to go to all these pain management courses in order to maintain my license. And now physicians are over-treating pain, and we're suffering with opiate abuse. To a certain extent, I think that um, this is an example of unintended consequences of regulation. Uh, I think sometimes regulators ought to back off and let physicians practice medicine the way they were trained, and we might not have um, these kinds of problems. Opiates have been chronically overused in this country for decades. It's only now that it's being recognized as a crisis, but it's been a long-standing problem. If, if you had even just a couple of examples of the most important forms of regulation that you think are hampering innovation, real value equation, affordable quality, advancements that you could bring into the market that regulate is getting in the way of. What, what would those be? What are the things that really well, One of the things that comes up, and, and I think the fellow from Anthem talked about it, is network development. I mean, look, if you join Kaiser, you're going to go to a Kaiser hospital. That's part of the value proposition, yeah. right? Most you're going to go to a Kaiser hospital and a Kaiser doctor, and that's a choice you make. What we see in Medicaid is that we have to serve everybody. We have to serve very large populations, very large geographies, and there's huge pressure on us to include everyone. Well, it's difficult to have a high value network when you can't discriminate among the providers and choose those people that you think offer the highest value or who are willing to innovate. So if we have to have a provider in our network and that provider will only contract with us on a fee-for-service basis, it removes our ability to go into value-based contracting. One of the most important things that we can do is change the way we contract with providers. The simple fee-for-service mechanism, which is still our most predominant way of contracting, um, doesn't encourage value, it encourages volume. Yeah, the, uh, let me give an example that, that follows on, on what you just brought up. So when I got to Geisinger a couple of years ago uh, and didn't have experience on the health plan side, um, there were providers that we were spending $500,000 a year on um, for visits. And the only thing they did was prescribe opiates. And they weren't even in our network. So these were our Medicaid, managed Medicaid patients that were allowed to go see this provider, who's basically a script doctor. And the rule is, I'm sorry, we had to pay for their prescription, right? Yeah. Because they, they go in and they get a prescription. And I said, I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm like, guys, cut these 10 guys off. 
and they say, we can't cut these guys off because you gotta go through this whole rigmarole before you take somebody out of a network. I'm like, they're giving bullets to our patients. You know, cut them off and then yeah. send the regulators to me. So we cut them off and the regulators show up and I'm like, you know, put me in jail. I, I got rid of five doctors that have only prescribed opiates to patients. There's never a medical bill. It's crazy. And let's reach out to those patients to get them in treatment. So the regular, or when we want to bring people in for fresh food, diabetics, we get in trouble. You know, it's, it's inducement, right? If we send a van around to pick yes. them up, it's insane. It's yes. totally insane. So, um, uh, th there's a long list of those things that, that we have said as an organization, let's just screw it, do the right thing, and the chips will fall where they fall. So, so we go and pick them up, um, giving money back. So we said, this is not innovative. I mean, if you go to Starbucks, they don't drink the latte and say it's good, you have to drink it, right? They make you a new one. We've never done that in healthcare. So about a year and a half ago, we said, if you don't like the care, if it's not good, if they were rude, if you don't understand anything you don't like, we'll give your money back. Well, the lawyers go nuts that you can't do that. We're trying to now actually roll that out in our New Jersey clinical uh, uh, campus in Atlantic City, and we're, the regulations are different, so we've just done it now in Pennsylvania. We've refunded a million dollars to our patients. I'm sure we broke a lot of laws doing that. Um, but <laughs> it's like, whatever. I mean, anywhere you go, they give you a refund if you don't like it. We're going into a consumer market. 70% of the people to pick Geisinger as a health plan. Choose it from a list. It is no longer the one thing yeah. you get from your employer, right? So they're choosing us. Guys, we got to be this. Every business except healthcare has a refund policy that's easy. So we have a refund policy too. Yeah, actually, you know what we found? <laughs> I mean, can, I, can, you, can you guys actually go deeper? Because I think it's interesting. What, like, what's the experience been? What have so, you learned? So we did, the... we did this thing. We're going to give you, what, and it built upon the proven portfolio that was already at Geisinger. So we had done evidence-based treatment around hearts Heart, yeah. and that the New York Times called the first warranty in healthcare 10 years ago. It was basically bundled payments, and you don't get charged for readmissions. Did the same in chronic care. And then we said, well, let's do it around experience, and let's give money back. And the board's nervous, and the CFO's nervous, and the lawyers are going crazy. But simple, no questions asked, we give your money back. You know, you're out of pocket, your copay or whatever. So we've refunded a million dollars. We looked back at the same time period before we had the refund program. Our refunds decreased with the refund program. Everyone gives money back. Everyone gives it back. We just kind of publicized it. We got $22 million, we think, of media coverage, and it decreased our refunds. But really what it was was a spirit of saying, hey, if we mess up, we're really sorry. We're going to try to fix it for the next guy. And oh, and by the way, here's a $20 uh, refund because we're, we're sorry that, the, that, we, that you had to wait. How you does know? that change your organization, how they come to work, what they prioritize, the decisions they make at the front line. We're working really hard to go from provider center to patient center. And yeah. when it's patient, in the beginning, people are thinking I'm getting in trouble for this. Yeah. No, the mindset is actually the opposite. Go find places where we screwed up and give the service recovery. So it used to be, you know, a guy would come in and he lost his dentures and we'd spend $5,000 denying that he lost his dentures in the hospital. The dentures cost 1800 bucks, right? So what we do instead now is say, here's the service recovery toolkit that you have. You get in trouble if you don't give it all out. Come on, we mess up all the time. And when you do service recovery, you create greater brand loyalty than if you actually got it right from the beginning. We have a lot of opportunities. So, yeah, I think it's empowered the frontline staff. And, and is it a bit of a canary in the coal mine? It starts to oh, it, raise it, the flag on, hey, there's actually it's, process gaps. It's, it's a secret shopper program. All, yeah. all our patients have we've brought in as secret shoppers instead of hiring McKinsey. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> you, this guy really is radical. Yeah, there you go. So you, you, you said you also have money back guarantee. And, or, well, or you're thinking our, about ours is a little different because we, we're, we're mostly doing Medicaid. So there are all kinds of uh, rebates and things where you give money back yeah. to the government. But I want to I want to change to another topic, which I think is really important and one that hasn't gotten a lot of attention. And it gets back to to where you live. OK, yeah. we take care of a lot of people who are um, disabled and who are homeless. And housing is a huge problem. And our medical costs um, go up uh, as a result of, of housing issues and behavioral health issues. So if you're schizophrenic and you're living under the bridge, we know that we're going to have a lot of ER visits for you that are probably unnecessary, a lot of unnecessary testing, uh, unnecessary prescriptions, simply because you don't have a stable place to live and somebody stole your meds. So unfortunately, Medicaid does not allow us to pay for housing. So one of the things we're looking at is, 
are there innovative ways or resources in the community that we can tap into to help our members be in stable housing situations? And it's not just the disabled and the chronically ill. I mean, increasingly we're seeing um, young women and children who are homeless. So housing affects your health status and it affects our health care costs. So it's really important for us that our members have a place to live and they're not out on the street. Could you imagine uh, changes that the state government could make, whereas they think about privatization and not just shift to managed Medicaid, but thinking about the social determinants and thinking about more encompassing contracts where you're yeah. accountable for all of that and well, make, make I mean, the trade-offs? We've, we've always argued for bigger contracts with more benefits so that we can coordinate all the benefits. One of the things we've been working on are these MMP contracts where we coordinate the benefits for Medicare and Medicaid for duels. Yeah. What you see in the fee-for-service world is this passing the buck back and forth between Medicare and Medicaid or who's going to pay for services, rather than saying, let's take all the money, attach it to the patient, and try to find the best outcomes. Um, and I think there's huge potential for that. We know that 5% of our patients spend half of our money. And so we need to attack those 5% of the really high-cost patients. And this is true you know, wherever you go. If you look at, at Medicare, the duels are 18% of the Medicare population, and they're spending at four times the rate and take up roughly half of the Medicare budget. And so what do we want to do uh, as a society? We're going to go out and penalize the relatively healthy uh, you know, MA members who um, really are low-spending patients rather than saying, what we really need to do is attack the high-cost, high-spending patients and do something about them. And that's where I think a lot of the innovations are going to come in the future. Dealing with the very high-cost patients who are spending a lot of money and a lot of it's being spent inappropriately, um, and that would lower costs for everyone. When you think about um, innovation, you've, you've raised uh, informatics and big data. So you just hear that everywhere, right? Just all the bluster. Is it just hooey, or do you actually see oh, no. big data analytics? <laughs> and how's that getting harnessed and making a big difference in, so, in your business? So, so we live it. So we're, we're, we're taking a, a shot, and we're calling it Springboard Health. We're starting in Scranton. So there's 76,000 people, and we're going to say that no one's going to be homeless there. We're going to know everyone's genome. Everyone's mm -hmm. going to have access to fresh food. No one's going to have health literacy. We know the risk factors to childhood uh, <laughs> adverse events and childhood abuse, and we're going to intervene. And the way we're going to do it is using data, because it's not just our data. It's that, that patient that you described living under the bridge that's schizophrenic, he's also the guy who goes to the, uh, in, in and out of jail 15 times. The recidivist is the readmission. When he's not being readmitted, he's being booked, right? It's, it's the same guy. Um, so big data to really be able to drive that. And then what we think we can do as a health system is be a convener, because there's a lot of community organizations that are already doing this work. But when you sit down and talk to folks who are on SNAP or folks who are getting uh, Section 8 housing, they tell you how crazy the system is. You know, you can get avocados over here on this day, but then you got to go over here and you got to fill this form out. So if we can bring all that together and make it easier in one-stop shopping, and that's using data too about what's going on. So we're, we, our four pillars are really around community organization, data, you know, access to great care, and then we've made a big bet on genomics. Mario, any thoughts on? Well, <clears throat> we're working with a company called Palantir, and yeah. we collect a tremendous amount of information. I mean, it's just a staggering amount of data that we have, and people can't make any sense of it. So what Palantir does is they take all this data and they mine it looking for patterns. So we look for um, areas where people are not getting services. We may find that there are um, certain areas where people are not getting their preventive health care services. Why is that? You know, is there an access issue? Is there an education issue? But they can pinpoint these things for us geographically. Um, in order to do some preventive services, we have found that there's some people we cannot drag them into a doctor, just can't get them to go. So we've begun going to them, making house calls, and equipping people to do as much as they can in the home, especially around preventive care when they have a visit, and then using Palantir to map these things out and, and do what the delivery companies do have a route map. What's the most efficient way that we can deploy a nurse practitioner on a particular day to see as many patients and get as many of these services done? Rather than saying, okay, today you're going to Santa Ana and you're gonna drive all the way to Santa Ana and then tomorrow you're gonna to go to San Bernardino. They can map it out and say you're gonna go here and then two blocks down the street is another person you're gonna see and so on and so forth. 
<coughs> these kinds of things are really helpful. And it's changing the paradigm. Uh, again, getting back to the issue of provider-centric versus member-centric. You know, what's best for the member? How are we best going to address these issues without forcing everyone to just go see a doctor or go see a hospital, go to a hospital? Let's go to them when, when we need to. It, it's, in the long run, it may be more efficient, even though it might be a little bit more expensive up front. When you're thinking uh, maybe even next three to five years in your innovation ag agenda, uh, how much of this is innovation you can undertake with your own organizations uh, versus needing to collaborate or partner with other vendors, especially providers, other organizations that bring in different, uh, different assets, different skill sets? Well, Geisinger probably has a little bit of an edge over us because they're more of an integrated delivery system. I really think that you know, for uh, a network model health plan like Molina Healthcare, we really do need to collaborate. It really is about collaboration, convening, coordinating, because you're right, there are lots of people who mean well, who are doing good things in the community, but they're not talking to each other. So as an integrated, I give the same answer. We can't do it ourselves. We, we, we need partners in doing it. We, we need partners that you know, understand uh, direct consumer better than us. We need partners that understand how to be in homes different than us. So even with all the pieces together, it's to me about collaboration. So when you, when you think about... Uh, so and and I would say it's also about copy. I, I don't think you have to be that great at innovating. I think you've got to see what other people are doing and just do the same a lot Spot of what works yeah, and then, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So you think of this as extended enterprise, you're gonna be partnering with other, other. How do you think about your, your talent pool, your human resources? Uh, if you think of sort of the history, a lot of transaction processing, moving into better use of data, um, influencing skills and so on. Uh, how, how do you think about what you're trying to hire in, the skill sets you need to be successful in the next three to five years and how that feeds into your innovation? Well, um, for us, things are changing. Uh, we acquired a company that does behavioral health. We've got about 5,700 providers now who are client-facing, everyday, uh, treating patients who have behavioral health issues or substance abuse issues. We operate 30 primary care clinics. We now have one multi-specialty clinic. So we're becoming mm -hmm. a little bit more integrated. Yeah. We're looking at um, a lot more home care, uh, both on the uh, professional side, um, where we have nurse practitioners who can go into homes or nursing homes to see our patients. One of the big gaps we found in nursing homes is that they don't, patients don't get seen often enough. And so they end up in the emergency room because they've got a problem that festers and then they have to be admitted. Whereas if we treated them up front, we can prevent admissions. Um, so I think it's, and, and then the other thing we do is we have what we call um, community connectors, which are trained lay people who go out and interface with the patients to find out what's wrong. You know, what do you need? What are you not getting? Uh, and there are eyes and ears in the patient's home. So I really think that for us, a big part of innovation in the next few years is going to be moving the site of care yeah. closer to yeah. the patient. Yeah, David, you asked about uh, the kind of folks we're looking for. We're looking for people that match our values as opposed to have the right mm -hmm. skill set. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's about caring. It's around kindness, humility, integrity, passion. Those are the things that we're looking for in people because no one really knows how to do this, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's uncharted waters in a lot of areas, so obviously we need people that understand big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. We need competent people around particular types of care delivery. We need great actuarial services, and we gotta fill those roles. Um, but we really think it's about everybody understanding that whether you're frontline or behind the scenes, it's about what you're doing to improve that patient's life or that member's life, easing their way. Um, so that, that's what we look for in people. And uh, Central Pennsylvania is great. It seems like everyone out there is like that. I, I thought it was fake when I moved there from LA. I'm like, who are these people? Uh, no one's cynical or a jerk. I, I, was, I, felt so, I felt so out of, I felt uncomfortable. <laughs> So once you, once you solve Pennsylvania healthcare, go back to my uh, home country of Canada. There you Lots go. Lots of great people there, there too. Yeah, yeah, I bet yeah. it's very similar. Um, so, so maybe, could you guys uh, maybe talk a little bit about um, maybe the different models? So I, I wanted to get back to this notion of, of having the integration vertically integrated versus virtually integrated. Um, any, any views on what you think is an advantage model? Are there ways that the virtual integration through innovation can mimic some of the strengths of the vertically integrated? So, so let me first clarify Geisinger, because um, <coughs> we're not Kaiser. 
Mm -hmm. So about 50% of our business is like Kaiser. You have a Geisinger insurance card, you see a Geisinger doctor, and you go to a Geisinger facility. That's about 50%. The other 50% of our business is open on either side. So you, some got, we yeah. sell Geisinger insurance in five states. We only provide clinical services in two. two. So some people have Geisinger insurance cards and are going yeah. to uh, other providers. In that case, we're creating that virtual network. We're taking what we've learned in our sweet spot and bringing it to our partner, clinical partners on the outside. And then internally, 50% uh, of our business at our hospitals and our clinics and our urgent cares are people with high mark insurance, Aetna, yeah. uh, uh, whatever, United. And there, that's again creating relationships from our provider side with with uh, different payers. So I guess you could car call ours the most complicated um, because sometimes we're playing different games. But what we really try to do is figure it out internally where we're all Geisinger and then bring that experience to our relationships on the outside. When um, we've talked earlier today about um, vulnerable populations, and um, one of the things that is, is, is really important is just the better integration of behavioral health and physical health. And this has always been a vaccine problem, but how do we do this? Is it co-location? How, how do you actually get? Any, any thoughts on, on um, innovations or breakthroughs that you've had on better integration? Well, that was you know, the reason that we started the Pathways program. Um, we know that uh, our patients who have a behavioral health diagnosis, like a chronic mental illness, their medical costs are double what those are patients who do not have that diagnosis. So behavioral health really does complicate medical care. Um, and it even leads to, to uh, shorter life expectancy. So we believe that it's very important to coordinate those and integrate those. I think we're starting to see more of the Medicaid programs moving that direction. But for a long time, uh, behavioral health was a carve out. Yeah. And so you had another health plan that was managing your behavioral health and one health plan managing your medical conditions um, as if they were two different things, like um, homeowner's insurance and auto insurance. You know, or they're totally separate. They're not. They're, they're very uh, closely related. And so it's really important that those things be integrated. In our clinics now, we have therapists. So that mm -hmm. um, if, if the physician says, you know, I want you to see somebody, we yeah. can walk you over and have you seen right then and there. Those kinds of things, I think, will in the long run help us to lower medical costs and increase patient satisfaction because we're taking care of the whole person. And yeah. it's, a, it's kind of a, a corny old thing, but we went to medical school, I'm sure, because we wanted to take care of people. And some of that's been lost. Um, in terms of our networks, you know, unlike Geisinger, you know, we have to cover huge areas. So we have to cover all of New Mexico as an example. And we have to treat people in areas where there are no physicians. And we have to you know, take people in who are on Indian reservations. And so for us, we have to have a very broad mixed model. But the way we tie it together is through information, sharing gotcha. information. And I think that's important, too. Yeah, to, to Mara's point about the carve out, it would be like going to the doctor. You have a sore throat with your kid, and they say, but we don't treat ears. You call a different 800 number for the tugging on the ear. That's what we did with mental health. It's crazy. So we have now embedded in all of our clinics therapists doing evidence-based treatment for depression, anxiety, ADHD. It's in the same place it, it, it happens. In all our clinics, all opiates are handled by a pharmacist. So no doc is writing pain meds anymore. All that pain med goes to one pharmacist who's connected with our electronic health record, knows where you're going, can sit down and talk to you about alternative treatments. Yeah. So we put in that clinic, we got about 200 of them, um, everything that you need mm -hmm. so that you don't have to go and call. Now, you still have to sometimes with some patients call a different 800 number, right? But that should be behind the scenes and the patient yeah. shouldn't be subject to that. Not the patient experience. Correct. Yeah. Correct. We'll have time, I think, just to, for some questions from the audience too. So if you can start to um, queue up your, uh, your favorite question you've always wanted to ask but never had a chance. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you guys about was it seems like uh, <clears throat> we have these really tough problems, uh, private sector um, innovation, there's a creative idea, and then it can kind of work in a focused way, but we always have trouble scaling it. Um, when you think about the innovation that you're working, how do you think about scaling it so that it actually matters, like it really moves the needle? I mean, one life at a time is, is important for sure, but how, how do you actually have these things scale more broadly? So I think for us there was always a criticism um, that what we did in our little Shangri-La was not scalable. 
you yeah. know, uh, a non-diverse population, people don't move. Uh, it, it's just a different mix than what I was used to in Los Angeles, yeah. where there's diversity. In we, we brought it to Atlantic City, diverse population, up and down, you know, economy there, and we were able to demonstrate the same benefits that we did in central Pennsylvania. So I think these things are scalable. I think the ingredients that you need to make these things scalable are willing participants that believe that we really need to move to do this kind of care. If they're still thinking about filling beds, there's no way we can scale what we're doing. If they think about hospitalizations as failures and want to take care of people close to home and drive down the cost of care, I think mm -hmm. some of the stuff we know could be beneficial to those kind of people. But you can't change their mind. So, because there's examples where we've tried to scale it and it hasn't worked, and I don't think it's because we don't, it, because we don't know what we're doing. I think we do it with the wrong people and it doesn't work. They really got to believe in what we're, and we could be wrong, but at least we're wrong together and we're yeah. going in that direction. Yeah. Mary, any thoughts on? Let me take a question. Ma'am. Oh, hi. Um, hi, I'm Meg Murray from the Association for Community Affiliated Plans. And Guy Singer, we're happy to have you as members. Um, and Mario, someday maybe we'll get you in Molina. <laughs> <laughs> but right now, we only represent the nonprofits. So, um, but sometimes I, we're a nonprofit. And sometimes you're a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> you're a wonderful plan. <laughs> um, but when you an, an both answered the question about changes in regulations that you'd like to see, I thought you might mention the Part Two CFR Part Two, which limits how substance abuse providers can speak to the people on the physical health or behavioral health side. And we'd certainly like to see that reg changed, but I wondered, um, given that it isn't changed yet, what you are both doing to help address that, you, especially using technology. Are there innovative ways that your organizations are trying to get around that reg? I don't know the specifics of that answer. As a psychiatrist, I think we are discriminating against mental health folks by not letting them get that information into their entire picture of their health. So I don't know the specifics of it, but um, to me, it's, it's um, it's a double whammy. You've got mental health, and then we, we say no one can know about it. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, if, if, if you're that schizophrenic and you're living under the, the, um, the bridge and you come in with chest pain, that's really important information that everybody needs to know. You know, I think we have a bit of an anachronism now in healthcare, And this is left over from the days um, you know, when people like Senator Kennedy were really worried about privacy, and about genetics. Um, when I was coming up in, in the field of medicine, we were taught about privacy. We didn't have a lot of issues. You know, you knew that you couldn't discuss certain things with people. By the same token, you knew that if someone was part of the brotherhood of medicine, right. you could talk about these things. You just didn't talk outside. Um, I think that people were worried because of pre-existing conditions that there would be discrimination. And so that's where a lot of these privacy laws came up. Now that we've eliminated the pre-existing condition issue, what we've done is we've handcuffed ourselves yeah. so that we don't have good communication. In a perfect world, I would like to see a bar on discriminating against people for pre-existing conditions and a big loosening on the privacy laws so that people in healthcare could communicate uh, in a professional way more easily. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Other, other questions? I know I'm getting way more than my fair share of questions. So. It's, and it's much more fun if we hear from you, instead of just talking at you, talking with you. Mark hardly had any chance at all to moderate his panel. He can jump in, and we can have sort of team, team moderation. I know this is not a shy group. Um, maybe just one more to tie back to our earlier discussions around what needs to happen in the, in the longer term on um, uh, uh, state-based reform. So you've, you've talked about some steps related to privacy. You all have talked about uh, more integration of um, social services, uh, even though there, there's some limits on how that can be covered in traditional Medicaid. The reason for those limits, as you know, and speaking as a former CMS administrator, is when there's an open-ended uh, uh, funding program to the states, the, the tendency is for a lot of fund, uh, funding for state activities yeah. to go through that. So part of being uh, a CMS administrator is playing whack-a-mole with a, a lot of uh, efforts to try to channel more funding through. A lot of the reforms uh, that we've talked about today put more of a, a limit on that, either through 
managed care plans, capitated payments, or uh, as Jason talked about earlier, uh, uh, benchmark uh, spending levels in, uh, in ACOs. And I wonder if you all have some thoughts around how this plays into the debate we're having now about whether Medicaid itself should be something more like a per capita program or uh, whether it should continue to be uh, a, a, an open-ended uh, type of entitlement. Boy, do I have thoughts. Um, you know, the uh, administration tried to sell, the administration in Congress tried to sell per capita and block grants as a way to give more freedom to states to innovate. And uh, that would be fine. States deserve to have more freedom to innovate. And I think that if you go back uh, uh, before the Obama administration, states did have more freedom to innovate. Um, but block grants are not necessary for innovation. Uh, you can do all kinds of things with waivers, as you know. The problem was there was a period of eight yeah. years where it became very difficult to get a waiver. The Obama administration was very strict, and they had a very centralized way of how they wanted things done. I called it the federalization of Medicaid. Now we're seeing the opposite. We want to go the other direction. But governors need to be careful. Don't trade off financing for freedom. Um, and there are ways to address the costs. Capitation is a great... Uh, uh, idea. If you look at Medicaid spending, 62% of the costs are in fee-for-service. Most of that is in long-term care, which has, been, which has not been addressed. So it's a great example of uh, relatively low-cost patients, TANF members for the most part, have been moved into managed care, and high-cost services, which need coordination, are not. I think that if we pushed harder on Capitated programs for long-term care, we could achieve a lot of the savings without having to get into some of the onerous issues around, around um, funding. Um, so I really think that, that that's what we need. When I talk to people in the administration, they say, well, yes, but we don't know that we're always going to have Donald Trump in the White House, and what happens if things change? The other thing I would say is that um, a big, big problem, and you experienced this, I'm sure, Mark, that we have all these great ideas and we try them as a pilot project for three years. And after three years, we don't have enough data or we don't have an answer. So we make it a five-year pilot, then an eight-year pilot, and then a 15-year pilot. But the problem is we never get independent validation. Every state program will tell you their waiver is successful. So we're out of time, but I'll get off my soapbox. What I think one of the things we need is independent validation. Hire McKinsey. You know, hire an outside firm that comes in <laughs> And looks, well, or anybody, so look at the data and tell us, is this really saving money and improving quality? I think the question. Uh, just a quick question. We're, a we're going to have to wrap up. And okay. Yeah, we've okay. got one minute left. I'm a primary care physician, Dr. Caroline Poplin. Do you all have productivity requirements for your physicians? So you have to see 30 patients and then answer phone calls at night, every night? No. So we, we hire doctors, and there's five things they need to do. They need to take great care of patients. They help, help us with access, help us with uh, teaching and research, help us with recruitment and retention, and be a good citizen. There's no productivity measures at all, and every doctor's paid at the minimum of the 50th percentile of the benchmark. If they want to spend all day with a patient, great. They want to make a home visit, great. There's no productivity. That's not access? I mean, do you have to have, uh, you know, open appointments uh, yeah. so that there's sufficient access? Yeah, they have to have access. I mean, you've got to be able to get in and see the doc. So most of our primary care docs would have in their schedule two open appointments for same-day appointments. But there's no productivity measures. Thank you. Are you looking for a job? I was going to say. <laughs> uh, I have a job. Okay. Here. <laughs> Just check. All right. We're, uh, we're out of time. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. Thanks, Thank you. I want to thank our panel. So you've just heard from uh, two outstanding physician leaders in reforming health care, and I can't think of a better way to uh, close out our day uh, than our, our keynote speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Bill Cassidy, uh, senator from Louisiana. Uh, you all have his bio in front of you. If you don't know already, uh, he is uh, uh, a liver disease specialist physician who has long been involved in care for underserved populations 
relations in Louisiana, uh, and also long been involved in a commitment to improving uh, health and health care through uh, public service uh, now, in, uh, now in the Senate. Um, we've talked uh, today about a lot of approaches to uh, by which states and the private sector can innovate uh, in Medicaid, in uh, state insurance exchanges, and through other mechanisms to get to better health uh, and lower health care costs. Uh, Dr. Cassidy is going to give us some remarks to put that into, I think, our, our current uh, uh, political context and his leadership on these issues, and then we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. Dr. Cassidy, very pleased to have you with us today. You always want to come into a talk and have a little bit of energy, a little bit of anxiety, if you will. I have that. I think Mark just told you I was going to be speaking about something of which I am not prepared. <laughs> so let's hope it still goes well. Uh, I am a doctor. It's, uh, can you turn off that slide for a little bit, please? Uh, I'll just ask you to bring it up when you can. Uh, I am a doctor during the camp. I'm a gastroenterologist, a liver specialist. Most people don't know what a hepatologist is. That's why Mark said a liver specialist. When you say a hepatologist, people think you either do snakes or venereal disease. And so it's just confusing. So we just go with liver disease. Uh, but my background is having worked for a public, a charity hospital, we call them in Louisiana, for about 30 years, teaching with LSU Medical School, doing research, teaching, working in a prison setting. And my focus has always been either the uninsured or Medicaid patients. I always ask patients that begs the question, why are Medicaid patients being seen in a hospital for the uninsured? And of course, anybody who knows Medicaid knows that it pays providers poorly, at least physicians. And so as a rule, physicians don't see Medicaid patients. And that just began my kind of an interest with it. So when I entered the state Senate in 2007, subsequently Congress, I've maintained that interest. Uh, let me first thank Mark and the McKinsey Group for being here. Way back when, when Obamacare passed, McKinsey came out with an article, The Three Imperatives of Controlling Healthcare Costs. Uh, one, to decrease the burden of administrative expenses, to, take, to decrease the burden of chronic disease, and price transparency. That has stayed with me ever since, and our reform efforts have always tried to implement those three things, because as a practicing physician, I always knew just how important those were. Now, the outline, if you will, of what I will speak about will be the federal-state relationship, which is principally Medicaid. I'm sure you've heard of it. But let me give you my perspective, and uh, uh, perhaps different from those who've already been here. I would say that the federal-state relationship in Medicaid is pathologic. Uh, that it is path pathologic because the federal government keeps tempting the state into doing things it should not tempt it to do, but the state, like any good person being tempted, easily succumbs, uh, and then discuss an approach that may actually address this, because so much is at stake, including those patients I used to care for in our Louisiana charity hospital system. Now, I just saw a headline my um, staff gave to me yesterday. Oregon, is, some lawmakers, are considering discontinuing the Medicaid expansion because the expansion, the expansion, because they cannot afford the match. Now, right now, that's about a 97.5 to 2.5% match. Uh, and there's about, I'm told, uh, uh, 350,000 people on the Medicaid expansion in Oregon, and that 10% match is going to eventually cost them $235 million. Now, that's quite remarkable. A blue state that has really pushed out there trying to expand Medicaid, and at least there's a proposal that even a 90% match is not good enough. Now, why is that? Well, first, let's just start with traditional Medicaid. We all know the FMAP is typically 60%. The state matches about 40%. And this has continued for quite some time. And that 60% always tempts the state to pay more. It becomes economic, economic development. And you indeed will hear governors talk about the need to balance the budget. That's why they expand Medicaid. Or the need to have economic growth and that's why they think Medicaid is such a good program. But it has consequences, if you'll put the slide up, please. Now, this is something which I just want to show. I don't have a... This is 1990. This is higher ed financing. If you went back to 1964, it would look like that. And here is Medicaid. 
And here, if you went back to 1964, it would look like that. And as Medicaid programs have grown, it has cannibalized other programs. So much so that by 2014, expenditures on higher education, which had started here, are down to 9.4%. The state funding is up to 19.1%. And this is projected to continue to grow and states are continually backing out of their financing of higher ed. This is just one program, but there is a cannibalization, and this being somewhat driven by the FMAP. Why do I say that? When I was in the state senate, we would speak about decreasing Medicaid, and it would be brought to us. Wait a second, if you decrease in our state at that time, we're getting about a 65% match, so imagine that they came to us and they said, we can save $35 million in state general fund by taking it out of Medicaid, but you lost $65 million. And so trying to subtract from something with such a generous match, incredible impact upon your state budget, number one, but also an impact upon those who provided benefits. I can promise you the American Hospital Association, the nursing homes, the physicians, Everybody who was a provider would come and tell you why those cuts couldn't be made and lobby that they shouldn't be made. But nonetheless, the state is tempted into abandoning its support for things like higher ed in order to otherwise support Medicaid. Now, let's continue with the temptation. I feel like we have um, really got something here. It, <laughs> If you look at on traditional Medicaid, currently, the amount of money being spent by the combined federal state contribution is about $42 to $4,300 per person, okay? That's not long-term care nursing homes, that is the medical patient. Uh, the average uh, expenditure on somebody in the Medicaid expansion population, in which the federal government pays 100%, is $6,300. The federal government, and the state together is putting up 50% more in the expansion population than in the traditional population. You can imagine why. The federal government paid 100%. People back home in Louisiana would say, it's free money. I mean, literally, like the cartoon you would see at nighttime TV with the guy in the green suit with the dollar bills poking all over himself. It's free money. And that was the mindset. If you look in Louisiana, we enrolled 450,000 people in the Medicaid expansion within 18 months. Whereas the average nationwide is $6,300 per participant, in Louisiana it is $6,700 per participant. When we go to a 10% share, Louisiana will be on the hook for $310 million. Now, we are having a budget crisis right now because of a $310,000 budget gap, but this will be added to that $310,000. Out of curiosity, I looked up California. I think they'll be on the hook for, at 2015 numbers, they'll be on the hook for their 10% will be $1.2 billion. Now, Peter Lee is in the front row. I suspect $1.2 billion is just chump change around Sacramento, huh? <laughs> Yeah, that's a line item that says Peter Lee's retirement. Um, uh, the point being that because the federal government paid 100%, states succumbed to the temptation to pay top dollar for these patients. Why do I say top dollar? We got Blue Cross Louisiana to tell us what the cost would be for a 35-year-old in Louisiana for a 100% actuarial value Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, roughly $61 to $6,200. Our state on paying Medicaid rates with a Medicaid provider panel is paying $6,700 for that 35-year-old. Now, uh, I may have my numbers a little bit messed up right there, but I can tell you when we calculate it, our state is paying 100% actuarial value for a Blue Cross Blue Shield patient. And that's why I say the states are tempted. Because it's free money, they, they, they are incredibly generous, but that generosity has set up a situation we're not driven only by the numbers enrolled, but, the amount by, but by the amount per enrollee, states are gonna be on the hook 
for sums they cannot manage. And so if Oregon is saying our 10% is too much for us, someone else in Oregon will say, but wait, if you cut that 235 million, you're gonna lose 2.4 billion. That's gonna be a hard conversation. Now I would argue that if the problem, and by the way, this has consequences for the, state, for the federal budget. Uh, as we all know, entitlements are sucking up our federal budget, crowding out other funding as well there. The federal Medicaid budget's currently about $545 billion and expected to accelerate in growth. We can also point out that financial gimmicks are used by states to try and pay down their share of the state match. Uh, there's estimates that it's about $33 billion in the intergovernmental transfers and about another $33 billion in provider taxes, all used to pull down federal match. But increasingly, the federal government attempts to limit that, which again puts the state more on the hook. It's estimated that these gimmicks pull down $150 to $200 billion in federal financing that would not go to the state with the state putting up true state general fund dollars. Now, if I'm gonna say that relationship is pathologic, can you go to my next slide, please? I think it's because we have misaligned incentives under the status quo. And usually in healthcare, that is the problem. This slide may be small to you in the back, but let's look at this. If this is the incentive to decrease cost, the federal government is incentivized. It does not want to pay more. The state is somewhat plus minus. If you are getting 100% federal financing, frankly, you're going to be very generous to those with whom you contract. But do providers care about decreasing cost? Probably not as much. Maybe they get a quality bonus from a well-run Medicaid Advantage program. Do patients care about decreasing cost? No. As a provider, as a physician, I can tell you anecdotes of people who go to the emergency room to get a pregnancy test something that would be $15 in the pharmacy, they walk out with a bill minimally 500, but you can imagine it would be more. So patients have no incentive to decrease cost. What about the incentive to combat fraud? Of course, the federal government wants the fraud rooted out. If the state goes after fraud, it has to give back to the federal government the federal government's share. So if you're a 70% FMAP state, and you recover fraud, 70% of that goes back to the federal government. That being, of course, a disincentive for the state to go after fraud. Uh, and for providers and patients, as a rule, it does not matter to them if anyone goes after the fraud. In fact, the providers might be threatened by it. So I think these kind of misaligned incentives are part of the problem. The answer, of course, is begged, and that is to align the incentives. Now let's go to a bill we put forward, which I, I, I put out there not for bragging rights, but just to kind of further the discussion. Uh, could I go to the next slide, please? Uh, we have something called the MAC Act. Uh, I forget what MAC stands for, but obviously it's a reference <laughs> to Medicaid. Uh, the Medi Medicaid Accountability and Care Act or something, which we introduced a few years ago, but which actually has become the basis of a lot of Republican proposals and which we continue to include in our proposals. In our MAC Act, we institute what we call the per beneficiary payment, but others call the per cap cap. Now, I can tell you, if you mention a per cap cap, uh, even in a group like this, there are gonna be some who immediately say, oh my gosh, we are going to rob patients of their health care." And you can certainly say that's gonna happen if I'm on Capitol Hill. But let me give you a little history of the per beneficiary payment or the per capita cap. It began in the early 90s with Bill Clinton on the left and Santorum and Phil Graham on the right proposing this. When my staff and I wrote this legislation, I think it was 2010, no, 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 2013. 2013, the Medicaid director of California was coming up with the same proposal. And I remember bringing somebody in to look at our proposal. And he said, are you working with the NGA? And I said, uh, no, not really. I mean, why do you even ask this? Howard Cohen, I think, asked me that. And I said, well, why do you even say that? He goes, because they're having a meeting right now in Chicago, six Democratic Medicaid directors, six Republican Medicaid directors, and a meeting hosted by Tam, Tom Daschle 
to propose a per capita cap. And it was kind of convergent evolution. There was a problem, and folks were all coming together. Now, I have a sense, I'm not quite sure, that the Obama administration got wind of what was happening in Chicago, knocked it down, dispersed it, threw it to the winds. Uh, and and uh, just because it was seemed somewhat disrespectful to the effort they were making. But nonetheless, I go through that to point out that it actually has origins on the right and the left and is seen as a reasonable way to address the lack of good, the, the, the malalignment of incentives that are working against both the federal and state government. And if I had a longer period of time, I would say also on behalf of the patient. So, First, let me differentiate a per-beneficiary payment from, because there'll be some in here who say, we don't like the per-beneficiary payment, we want a traditional block grant. First, let me address the traditional block grant. I think the traditional block grant is a lousy idea. And I say that because if you just take historically what, what the state has received and they continue to receive it, then those states which have gamed the system, and some have all have gamed it, but some have really gamed it, uh, those that have gamed it are rewarded, and those who have not gamed it so much are penalized. That's not fair, number one. Number two, there are incredibly different and changing demographics to states. The best example I can give after Hurricane Katrina, Louisiana lost maybe 25 to 50% of its Medicaid population. They went to Texas and Georgia and all over. If we had been stuck in a block grant, Louisiana would have continued to receive all the money it received before we lost 500,000 Medicaid recipients. Uh, but Georgia and Texas would have been penalized. On the other hand, as they begin to come back in, those folks begin to move back home to Louisiana, frankly, the payments to our state lagged behind. And so we had a little bit of a, a oh my gosh, we're not getting enough because folks were moving back but the kind of adaptation to their moving back in terms of federal payments was delayed, and we ended up having some hard fiscal times because of that. But that said, if it had been, if it had been just a traditional block grant, what you get is what you always get plus an inflator, then we would have done great with that, but Texas and Georgia, not so much. Secondly, demographics change. Um, New York has a declining population. Texas just picked up three million people in the last, uh, last decade. Many of those folks would qualify for Medicaid. And so if, again, you have a traditional block grant, then those that are growing in population are penalized, those shrinking shrink. Lastly, I will say that some populations age more than others. So Vermont, Florida, Pennsylvania, elderly population, lots of blind and disabled long-term care, obviously their costs going up. Uh, in Utah, uh, it seems every Utah family has 10 kids. They're young and they're healthy. Uh, so you obviously want your cost basis to reflect the health of your population. So what we propose in the MAC Act is a per beneficiary payment, but you break it down into four categories. You break it down into long-term care, blind and disabled, children, and adults. Very different cost basis for each. And you would have, over time, if this is the 51 jurisdictions taking Medicaid, including Washington, D.C., you would have a scatter graph. And over 8 to 10 years, everybody would move down into a mean plus or minus 10%. So if you have somebody really paying a lot for long-term for long care, but it doesn't seem justified by a, a difference, geographic difference in expense, uh, or disease burden, they would gradually move down. But on the other hand, a state that was not getting as much money uh, could come up. I'm actually establishing a different paradigm here. The paradigm is that the federal government is going to make a guarantee payment for someone in poverty's health care no matter where they live. Um, and so, so it becomes, again, a patient-level guarantee, not a state-level guarantee. Um, uh, uh, let me see what else. Uh, we would increase a state's FMAP, but we would do away with the ability to use financing gimmicks. We actually think we would hold states harmless. By the way, the power of these financing gimmicks, I spoke to someone, he says that his statutory FMAP is 63%, but his effective FMAP is 80%. 
another whose statutory FMAP is 70%, but their effective FMAP is 90%. So uh, these intergovernmental transfers, provider taxes, and other mechanisms really do pull down a lot of extra federal dollars. We would increase the, excuse me, increase the FMAP, but do away with those financing gimmicks. Um, and we think between the per beneficiary payment, you're going to get this much money, uh, and you can't use gimmicks, we would begin to create a stable system in which the state would be incentivized to be wise managers of the dollar, not just spend it because it's cost plus contracting. We would also allow states to keep 100% of recovered waste, fraud, and abuse. So as opposed to having given the federal government back 70 to 80 or 90%, they keep it all. Because they're getting a set amount per beneficiary, why would they now be why would they not be aggressive at recovering the waste, fraud, and abuse? And lastly, if a state did a great program and they lowered cost, my state has a high uh, amount of obesity, which in of itself engenders a lot of uh, healthcare spending. What if we came up with a tremendous program that actually decreased the incidence of obesity, therefore the manifestations of the metabolic syndrome? Well, we would spend less money on caring for those patients. But we would allow the state to keep that money to put back in to some other healthcare program. We think we incentivize them in that way to address what McKinsey identified seven or eight years ago, which is to decrease the burden of chronic disease. We incentivize the addressing of chronic disease. So let me finish, and then I'd love to take questions if any have. Again, uh, I think that the relationship between the federal government and the states is pathologic. States constantly tempted into spending more money because the federal government hangs out such a generous match. But we find that even a 90-10 match will not be sustainable. Partly this is due to the misaligned incentives. It is just inherent in the way this program is structured. But we think that if we align those incentives, and we think the best way to do that is through a per beneficiary payment, we can actually address this. One more thing I should say, folks assume that a per, per beneficiary payment is less generous than what a state would currently receive. Under our proposal, the state continues to receive that which it has. It's just that we anticipate that savings from the uh, bending down of the cost curve. So it isn't so much that we immediately claw back dollars, it's just that we think the incentives being aligned means that there will be cost savings in the future, and those will amount to a large, uh, we think that will amount to a lot. Uh, I'll look at my staff. Did I leave anything out? Uh, uh, well, thank you all very much. All right, thanks, Senator Cassie. Actually, that was right on target with uh, the, the themes for the conference, especially around the support for long-term uh, uh, improvements in, in health, population health, and, and health care efficiency. Um, we did have a, a lot of questions, though, also about some short-term issues, especially around repeal and replace of the ACA and the uncertainty that, that, that that's creating. Uh, um, while, uh, if there are any questions, please come out to the microphones. But uh, while you're doing that, uh, any um, thoughts that you have about where this is all going to end up? No, well, I have thoughts, of course. You know, candidate Trump ran saying that he was going to maintain coverage, care for those with pre-existing conditions, lower premiums without mandates. Now, again, we have a bill out there, the Patient Freedom Act, mo known colloquially as the Cassidy Collins Bill, uh, and we think we accomplished that. Uh, we also think we accomplished the complexity by, frankly, delegating back to states with some guidelines. Uh, ours is um, not yet accepted, but I'm not sure that the House proposals are yet to be ex uh, accepted. The House sacrifices coverage, and that's where they get their savings. I think candidate Trump's pledges are not fulfilled, but I can tell you that uh, Mike Pence and others are working the hill. Brian Blaze is coming to speak to folks. They're trying to convey it. I just don't think it uh, personally works. Okay. Peter. Yeah, uh, Senator Cassidy, great presentation, incredibly thoughtful, and I'm actually not going to talk about repeal and replace. Uh, one of the elements you didn't talk about in your in the MAC Act is incentive alignment on the provider side. But I think it's absolutely true. My experience is providers will always want more and protect their turf. Can you talk about uh, specifically how there's a better alignment of incentives 
under that act for providers and how they stand to gain with more value and efficiency, because that's one of the great failures I think we have in the healthcare system generally. Yeah, uh, so one, a, a well-run managed care company, of course, is going to align incentives for providers, right? Fair statement. Uh, secondly, I think that um, one thing we allow, by the way, is the state to take their Medicaid expansion population, uh, we do that in the Patient Freedom Act, to take their Medicaid expansion population and transition them uh, with different benefit design into the private insurance market. Uh, so uh, a provider group, for example, going to two-sided risk would be able to take that on, uh, and once you have two-sided risk, I think you align incentives. But I think, again, insurance programs are increasingly moving to that sort of two-sided risk model. Um, not always, but I think they are, uh, because that's the only way you align those incentives. But, you know, just, I agree with you totally, Peter. You got to align the incentives. Joyce Frieden from MedPage today. I was wondering, uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, value-based payment and alternative payment models today. And so, Senator, I was wondering if uh, you, any of your legislation would encourage those types of models. Yeah, well, first, we know that current law has a lot of encouragement for such models. Uh, but we try and be as bare bones as possible, delegating to states, um, let me start over. Let me start over. I am going to speak now as a physician who worked in a public hospital system. And I found that if the patient had the power, the system lined up to serve the patient. Um, if the patient didn't have the power, she'd be like flotsam and jetsam tossed this and that way by the waves and the sea and the wind. So under our proposals, we very much favor the patient getting a certain account pre-funded health savings accounts with a catastrophic or a high deductible health plan and a pharmacy benefit. And then she chooses the policy. Now I'm kind of melding our Patient Freedom Act with our Medicaid reform bill. And then she chooses the coverage she wants. There's a lot of data out there that when the patient is empowered to control her spending, she controls her spending. The Medicaid waiver uh, that Indiana received, Indiana Plus, is the latest example. But there's a lot of other examples of when the patient controls the dollar. We also couple that with price transparency, uh, which again, way back when, McKenzie said, this is what we should do. And if you have price transparency coupled with the patient having ownership, we think she is empowered to make wise decisions. Now, at that point, you begin to restore a market. We want value-based purchasing. So the patient should have the ability to say, oh, my daughter's been prescribed a CT scan of the abdomen. Do a scan, do, do a little app, scan your app. It could be $250 here or $2,500 there. Over here at $250, I have to go midnight at Thursday. Well, baby, we're staying up Thursday night, you know, because we're going to save that money. I picked 250 and 2,500 because there was an LA Times article the cash price for a CT scan in LA Basin a few years ago varied between those two numbers. So once you have price transparency, I think you begin having a normal marketplace. And um, another example, my state, they passed a law that a PBM could not gag a pharmacist on what the cash price of a drug would be. Because there are people coming in to get medicines if they paid cash, they would pay one-third of what they would pay through their insurance policy, but there was a gag contract that would not allow the pharmacist to tell the patient that. So again, I think once we restore normal market forces, we can do that. We also believe in all the other things that people speak of regarding value-based purchasing, but I think the missing element so far is empowering the patient and giving her the uh, information she needs to purchase value. Thank you. Senator Cassidy, thank you very much you, for your leadership and for joining us today. Thank you. All right, we are just about done. We have covered a lot of ground today related to state and private sector innovation in Medicaid and in state programs and individual insurance markets, including topics that have ranged from how to support fundamental changes in care and public health, 
uh, to the timing of the rate filings and risk adjusted rate updates in California. Uh, it is all related and while that might seem complicated and while the politics certainly is complicated as well, there are some clear vital directions and imperatives uh, where we think real progress is possible. So you've heard a lot of views on these issues today. I want to thank our fantastic speakers again for sharing their insights, uh, sharing their perspectives on the future of the healthcare system and innovation in uh, improving it and navigating through change and uncertainty. Uh, we really appreciate all of these perspectives, especially at such a critical time for the future of healthcare in America. Uh, just a reminder too though, that the views expressed here by all of our participants are their own. They don't necessarily represent the views of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy or the McKinsey uh, uh, Center uh, or McKinsey and Company as well. Um, I also want to uh, uh, thank uh, uh, McKinsey's uh, um, Center for U.S. Health System Reform, uh, which is their source of expertise on these uh, reform issues, as well as the staff and faculty at uh, the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy for making this uh, event possible today. Uh, both McKinsey and Duke Margolis share the goal of supporting public, private, social sector innovation to transform healthcare and the policies that can enable that uh, based on better evidence and more knowledge and sharing all of it. So in that spirit, uh, the recording and video from today's event will be available on our website uh, at uh, uh, healthpolicy.duke.edu, the Margolis Center website, and also at uh, uh, the McKinsey website, healthcare.mckinsey.com. The materials related to today's discussions are, are all available, uh, will be available on the web, also are at the, uh, uh, at the uh, front desk if you haven't gotten a copy already. And please do uh, keep in touch with us, uh, follow what's going on with the websites. Uh, we're gonna keep working together on on taking steps to address these critical issues of improving health and getting healthcare costs down. In the meantime, thanks again for joining us in this discussion today, and we hope you have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you.